and time. All right, I hope nobody was expecting a break because you don't get one. We are going straight into Dragon Quest V here. I am Era of Rudo. We've got uh, right, Mocha Poid here doing the run. Break because you don't get one. We are going straight into Dragon Quest V here. I am Era of Rudo. We've got a uh, Mocha Poid here doing the All run. All right. So we, we get the start here. Uh, we're getting a bit of a, a flashback dream sequence here to the, uh, the hero's birth. And so you get to pick what your name is here. And Papas, our dad here, is going to walk around and suggest a few names. And then... Your, your mother, Martha, here is going to choose whatever name you actually enter it in. We're going to go with that name. Pop's best dad, absolutely. <laughs> I hope everybody's having a good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever time it is for you. It was a very fun Dragon Quest IV run. Thank you very much, Crimson, for that. It was, it was, it was great to see a number of those glitches that we don't normally get to see in in most runs. <laughs> it was a, that was a pretty fun showcase there. All right, so we, we start this game out as a child. Uh, it's basically split up into three what we call generations throughout the run. Uh, Gen one or childhood here starts out with our character um, at six years old. And we are currently traveling the world with our father, who he is looking for the legendary hero that is supposed to defeat the Demon Lord. But he's also looking for our mother, who went missing shortly after we were born. And we're about to stop by our... Uh, what we see as our hometown of... Uh, early, early on our journey here. Uh, just a few people that we talked to on the ship to progress the story, and then we're going to go ahead and land here. Oh, yeah, that is absolutely true. The, this story does get quite dark. <laughs> it's uh, it's one of the darker stories, but definitely has some of its bright moments. It's a very fun game. The story is very, very deep. With a little bit of choice in there as well. Can't argue with that. Yeah, this was released on Super Famicom. We did not actually get a uh, Super Nintendo localization. The first English localization that we got for this game was the DS version. So, uh, any official runs on the original release here will have to be on the SFC. There is, there's a fan translation for English on the SNES. However, it's obviously just a ROM. It's not a, It's not an official release. There's no English cartridge or anything like that. All right, so getting off the ship here, uh, Papas is going to go talk to this guy and then tell us to not wander too far. And of course, we are a disobedient child, which will kind of be the defining characteristic of our character in the. Uh, in the first generation here. We're gonna go straight outside and get into a fight with a few slimes. Uh, this first fight is static. It's as soon as you go outside, it's always three slimes. And after a couple of turns, Papas is gonna pop in and take care of them for us. Too far, here we go. <laughs> See what slime we hit. Oh, we got a slime C kind of a day here. So we attack twice, and then Papa shows up, and he's gonna one shot them and has a chance to attack twice. So we defend after the first one is dead, and it's gonna be faster to just let him fight his way through here. And then we get our introduction to the first mechanic of Papa's here, where after the fight, if we're damaged, he just heals us up. So boom, we're back at full health. And then Papa's actually takes control here. This is a static encounter. Uh, it, it's always these four monsters, it's always on this tile. However, the actions that are taken are uh, selected randomly by the AI. So if you're really lucky, then in two turns you get two double attacks and 
makes it nice and quick. But if you're unlucky, it can take four rounds, <laughs> and it's just a pure time loss. Oh yeah, Pappas is OP. We're never going to be as strong as Pappas. Okay. And now we have arrived at our hometown of Santa Rosa. Everybody's excited to see Pappas because we haven't been around for several years. So here we still don't have control. Uh, there's a few points in Gen 1 where the computer just controls where you're going. Your character's just following along, which I think is kind of a nice touch. Because, you know, you're... You're just a child, so it makes sense that, you know, you're just following your dad around. And the fact that the computer basically just takes you by the hand and carries you through here is thematically appropriate. It's a nice touch, I think. Hero's family gets a bit weaker each generation. <laughs> That's kind of true. Well, not so much. I mean... Your, uh, your daughter becomes quite powerful in this world. Alright, so here we meet Bianca. Uh, she remembers us from the last time we were here, but we were too young. She's a couple years older than us. She's eight years old. Takes us upstairs to read us a book. And then her mom's gonna be like, hey, it's time to go. So unfortunately, we don't get to hear the story about the wonderful castle in the sky. But it's okay, I'm sure that's not information we're ever going to need. Uh, so in that dresser, there's a, a leather hat, which we're picking up. Uh, it's going to help us out defensively at the beginning, and then a little extra gold to sell for the boomerang later on. Yeah, Bianca is the best waifu. Unfortunately for the speedrun, we, uh, we marry Flora, because she's a lot more stable. There's a mechanic with her that uh, makes the latter half of Gen 2 a lot more stable. Whereas, you have to get super lucky with Bianca. So here we're buying a bamboo pole for 50 gold. I'm going to go upstairs here and grab this extra herb. Gen 2 on DS states that Bianca's 21 and Hero 25. Huh. <laughs> That's interesting. I haven't played the DS version in a very long time. Alright, so our first little mini adventure on our own here is going up into this cave, and our, our main goal down here is to rescue a dwarf that got uh, stuck under a boulder. Uh, we're going to need him to create some medicine that we're going to be taking uh, for Bianca's dad. But on our way down, uh, we're going to take some fights here to get the hero one more level. And then we're also going to pick up a leather shield and traveler's tunic for defense purposes, and also for selling. <laughs> These encounters are not very very nice. The, uh, the slimes here are almost not even worth taking the time to fight, because they're only worth one experience each. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a wash on whether you actually fight, you know, when it's just slimes or just run away. So this chest is the shield, and then Moko here just equipping all of the defensive equipment. This is actually a pretty good fight. So these guys will usually either die in one hit or they're defending. So either way they're not really dealing really much damage and they're worth a good chunk of experience. So the main reason it's important to gain one level in this cave is that uh, when you level up your obviously your stats increase but your max HP, max MP that are added to your stats do not replenish just by leveling up. It just increases the maximum but not your current. So we're sitting here with 0 MP, and uh, we're going to gain, you know, plus 4 MP off of the level. And then we're going to use the inn before heading out for our next adventure, which is going to refill our MP. Uh, the reason that's important is that's the only inn that we're going to get before the next dungeon. And so getting that extra MP means that we have one more heal for uh, Lunar Castle, which is not a gentle place to be. <laughs> you want to have as much healing available there as possible. Alright, so we rescued our friend here. And we're going to go up here and loot this chest. That's going to be the uh, the Traveler's Armor. 
And at this point, we want to death warp. So we're going to go back to this transition, very similar to how things were in uh, Dragon Quest IV. Going back and forth through these transitions increases our chance of getting an encounter. And oh, so we're not quite ready to death warp because we didn't get that level. So this fight should level up. And then we're going to go for the death warp. I was wondering why Moko didn't unequip the armor, but that makes sense. There's level three. Now they're going to unequip. And Death Warp. Get ready for Death Warps. There's quite a few of them in this run. Yeah, screen transitions do uh, have a higher chance to trigger battles. I, I don't know exactly how it works in 5, but I, I know in 4 it's like a 1 in 3rd chance every time you go. I don't know if it's just an increased threat in this one or not. So this, the movement right here, is actually a setup for a little half tile glitch. So you see how we talked to that guy on a half tile? If you talk to him right there and then move left as the dialogue ends, he actually moves down and out of the way. And that lets us get back to this dresser here. And that's got a hand-woven cape, which we're going to sell for a little bit more gold. The, the one of... You know, a couple very minor glitches that we use during this run involving half tiles. The next one is going to allow us to have uh, some form of control during an ice puzzle. All right, now it's the next morning and we are on our way to Bianca's hometown, El Capa. We're going to go deliver the medicine uh, to her father, and Papas, being the chivalrous man that he is, does not want Bianca and her mother traveling on their own through these horrific, monster-infested lands. Now here, there, any encounters that you get during this walk are completely random. Uh, I have... Okay, this is the best encounter to get. This is a ton of gold. <laughs> this is very, very good. This is what you want to see on this walk. I have an unusually high occurrence of zero encounters on this walk, and then you end up getting just no herbs for the castle, but we're gonna be in really good shape after this encounter. Plus already level four, that gives us the heal spell. And 65 gold, huge. And there is still time for another encounter, so we might get more money going in here. Nope, just the one. But that's fine. Papas doesn't want to miss out on the XP. Yeah, Papas really needs 90 experience. <laughs> His 400 HP isn't quite enough. He, he wants to grind up a little bit. How many marriage candidates? Uh, just the two. We just have uh, Bianca and Flora in this version. Deb was added in the DS version only. So outside of the DS, you've got you know just the two to choose from. All right, so here uh, we're basically going to end up selling everything and buying some herbs and potentially a holy water. Everybody kind of does this shop a little bit differently. I like I sell everything right here and then start purchasing, but everyone's got their own little gold routing. Um, basically, the goal here is to get a bunch of herbs for the castle, possibly a holy water to just eliminate less valuable encounters on the way to the castle, and then at night we're going to end up buying the boomerang after looting some stuff to sell in the end. The boomerang is a wonderful weapon that hits all enemies on the screen, regardless of grouping. So it's a huge advantage to have that early. It makes a lot of things fightable that at our level normally would be kind of rough. And there we talked to uh, these bullies that were beating up the cat. That's uh, that's Barongo. He's going to be joining us once we're through the castle here. But they won't stop tormenting the cat until we go defeat the ghosts in the castle, so we agree. It's like, alright, we'll go deal with the ghosts, you give us the cat, everybody lives happily ever after. Well, kind of. Okay, probably not. Nobody lives happily ever after in this game. <laughs> Spoilers. Alright, so here we, uh, we're gonna spend the night before heading back in the morning, but... 
Bianca wakes us up in the middle of the night saying, Hey, remember, we're, uh, we're gonna go deal with those ghosts. Let's go now. So, because she wakes us up here, we actually don't get this rest. So, when I mentioned that we we don't get an in uh, between Santa Rosa and the castle, it's because she woke us up there. She woke us up right before the MP recovered. Quite rude of her, really. So, I'll grab a couple of items out of the uh, out of the dressers there. There's a chimera wing and a defense seed, which we are going to sell to bring our gold total up over 420 so that we can buy the boomerang right here. Yeah, thanks, Bianca. Yeah, if it weren't for that, you know, we'd have a lot of MP to work with uh, after that level up on the way here from the Ghost Rats. Yeah, so here we're basically going to sell everything except for... Uh, looks like Moko's keeping the Traveler Tunic instead of the plain clothes. Which isn't surprising, considering the Goblin Rat encounter. That, that gives so much extra gold here. But yeah, basically everything else is going. We might be able to afford to keep Bianca's shield. Which is always really helpful, so that Bianca doesn't get obliterated. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there was a special mechanic with Flora in Gen 2. It actually starts out right here with Bianca. Where if she dies in combat, she's going to revive with 1 HP once the once the fight is over. Um, because of that, she's pretty expendable overall. Uh, some people you'll see put her in front so that she can, you know, tank damage. Um, but, okay, so did not get the holy water for this, so we are going to fight our way up to the castle. Not particularly surprising, it's just a few safer encounters might get one more level before we get into the castle. Uh, but as opposed to Bianca reviving automatically after combat, uh, if Hero dies, whether Bianca's alive or not, uh, we're going to get sent right back to the church, and it's going to count as a wipe. So that's half our gold gone. It's time wasted. So we want to protect Hero at all costs here. But starting out at level 4 is really good. So we got level 2 on Bianca. That fight actually went really well. Uh, those stink weasels can put the party to sleep, which, you know, has obvious problems with it. The last thing you want at any point in the game is for your entire party to be put to sleep. Alright, so here we are at Len Lenoir Castle. So, the encounters here are significantly more dangerous than the ones outside. Uh, the Night Whips, which are... Not these, these are snakes. The Bone Snakes can... Uh, call for reinforcements, so uh, there's, there's a chance that things get out of hand pretty quick here, but it, as long as they're not calling reinforcements, then Boomerang's gonna make short work of them. Oh, there's a reinforcement. So, one, uh, one key detail to note here is that similar to Hero in the cave at the beginning, uh, Bianca starts with zero MP, so she's not gonna be able to cast any of her spells. She's gonna learn the Blaze spell right there, actually. Perfect timing. And that is going to be very useful in helping out with some of the trash, but also key to defeating the boss in this area. And she's not going to have the MP to uh, cast that at all until we're most of the way through this castle. There's going to be an inn that we stop by inside. So until then, she's kind of just a meat shield. <laughs> but we, we want to make sure that she survives as many encounters as possible, because we want her to get to level 6 to have enough MP to... Uh, to make the boss very consistent. If you can get her to level 7, it's even better, because then she learns the defense spell, and it makes it so that the hero's boomerang hits as hard as her blaze does. Speeds it up quite a bit. Hardest dungeon in the speedrun? That would be the volcano. <laughs> but yeah, this is definitely... This is definitely up there, though. A lot of runs just get reset right here in the castle just because it's it, it can be really rough to learn. It's all about resource management, and it, especially if you don't get a good encounter prior to reaching El Capa and you don't have very many herbs, uh, the danger level in here can be very difficult to overcome. All right, so here, oh, <laughs> all right, so that that one on the right there, that's a night whip. Those can cast sap 
which... You know, it's... It's not too bad since you don't have a lot of defense to start with, but at the same time, as I said, this is all about healing resource management at this point, so... You don't want to take more damage than you have to, and that sap can quickly get things out of hand. Early reinforcement on the snake there. Uh, we also saw a babble in that previous encounter. Uh, their attacks can poison you, which fortunately does not tick while you're inside the castle, so... Getting poisoned early on the overworld map is a bit of a problem, because you're gonna start losing HP before you even get here, but once you're inside the castle, the poison actually just does nothing, which is very fortunate. Level 4 on Bianca there. More max MP that we do not have access to yet. Yeah, when you get a lot of encounters in that dark room, it can get pretty hard <laughs> to judge where you are. Oh, this is not a good encounter. Alright, Mogo's just gonna try to run and hope for the best here. This is a... <laughs> Alright. So here's a good chance to talk about run chances in this game. So, similar to Dragon Quest IV, uh, you've got a 50% chance on the first two run attempts, 75% chance on the third, but unlike Dragon Quest IV, which goes to 100% on the fourth one, Dragon Quest V caps out at 87.5% from the fourth attempt on. So you are never guaranteed to run. The uh, longest run fail streak I've had was six, and I've had that happen a couple of times, and it just, it always just feels bad. But what happened there was the hero character died, and as I stated earlier, yeah, hero dying right here just counts as a full party wipe, so that's half the gold gone and back. Now, the upside to this is this means that we're going to get more encounters, which means there's a higher chance that Bianca's going to get to level 7 uh, before the boss ghost. Which would give us access to the defense spell and make that fight very free. Yeah, and she does have... she does get her MP now, so she can actually help out with fights by casting Blaze, which is a pretty big deal. So as far as wipes go in Dragon Quest speedruns, this is actually one of the better places to do it, because it actually allows you to come back stronger. <laughs> it, it's kind of it's kind of an interesting one. I've actually had some times where I wipe in the castle and then I end up saving time because the MP lets me breeze through a bit. Lots of encounters. Okay, so at this point in the castle, our our current goal is to get down into the basement where we are going to run into the ghost of the king. And he's going to ask for our help clearing the ghosts out of the castle. Which, how convenient, that's what we were here to do anyway to save Barongo, right? So, we'll agree, we'll agree to do that. He's going to tell us, alright, there's a torch in the kitchen, and that torch is going to allow us to see in this dark room. And there's a, a set of stairs in this room that you can't use unless you have the torch active. Like, even if you know where it is and walk over it, it you can't actually go up the stairs yet. It's a little bit unfortunate. It'd be great if you could just go straight up there, right here. It would cut some time out of it. Oh, well. It's not safe to use stairs in the dark. So there's the Ghost of the King. And this floor is 
the most dangerous part of the castle, in my opinion. Uh, when you first get here, sometimes you're still, like, level 3, like if you haven't gotten very many encounters. Sometimes you're level 3, sometimes you're level 4. And this is the floor where you can start encountering the Mad Candles. And Mad Candles hit hard, have a lot of HP, and can cast Blaze. So if you run into a large group of them, then they can dish out quite a bit of damage and just start chewing through your herbs. Or potentially even just kill you. Um, around level 5, Hero's got a decent chance to one-shot a candle if it's in the front slot. Because you'll notice that the boomerang hits all targets, but the damage decreases after each target that it hits. So the target in front is always going to be hit the most. And you can high roll your damage, and the Mad Candle can low roll its HP. And then you might get that first one killed, which makes them a lot safer. If you get here at level 4, you're almost never going to pull that off. Hey, Mad Candles. Didn't quite get the kill on the front one. This should kill both of them, though. And the Mad Candles have a chance to drop a Bronze Knife, which can sell for... Quite a bit of gold. I don't remember exactly how much it was. It's been a while since I've gotten one. Uh, but it's it's a good safety item to get. And help out with buying some gear later on. So here we use the torch. And now we're going to be able to use the stairs. Watch out for creepy statues. Alright, so this front pot here has an herb. Don't mind if I do. And then here, if you go up through this door and then to the right, we... Oh, oh man, three candles. Uh, if you go through that door up and to the right, that's where the inn is. However, you wake up from the inn outside, and the front door is currently locked. So if you go straight to that inn, you have to go through the whole castle. Again. So it's important to remember to go down these stairs and unlock the front door before you use the inn. At least if you're looking to go fast, which we are. That fight went really well. Good experience. And lots of mad candles coming up. <laughs> yeah, DQ6, I would say, is an acquired taste for sure. Like, I love the first few hours of it. And I'm undecided on the rest. Alright, so now that the front door is unlocked, go through here, after this fight, more candles. Alright, so Bianca's kind of at risk here, even though she's defending. Okay, good, killed the front one. Uh, depending on the damage roll on the second one, we might kill both of them on this turn. Nope, not quite, it's got like 1 or 2 HP left. And Bianca gets the kill. Bianca level 6, so... She's already at the level that we need to defeat the final boss here, and we haven't even beaten the mini-boss yet. That's <laughs> one, what I was saying about getting more experience after the wipe. Uh, at level 5, Bianca learns the Surround spell, which... I wouldn't say it's critical to the mini-boss encounter in here, but it definitely makes it a lot safer. Uh, it's a 50% chance for anything afflicted by Surround to miss, but... They don't seem to care. A lot of the time. <laughs> we'll just start hitting anyway, or just cast Blaze, which doesn't really matter. That's not impacted by Surround. Alright, so here we get the free in, wake up outside, and we're gonna go to the mini boss fight. Now, the mini boss fight may not seem like much, but it's gonna be four of the Mad Candles. Now, the reason why Surround is so significant there is when you run into the Mad Candles just randomly out here, uh, as with all enemies, they spawn with a range of their maximum HP. I believe it's 75 to 100% of their maximum HP value. And the any like mini boss static encounters things like that always start at 100%. So the four mad candles that we're going to encounter uh coming up here are all going to have max HP. So there's zero chance of one-shotting the front one. So it's a it's a much more dangerous fight because you're going to be dealing with, you know, four of them attacking. through the trapdoor, and all these skeletons transform into mad candles, apparently. Alright, so we get surround. 
I got three out of four. It's not bad. <laughs> and of course, two of them hit anyway. We got one miss. All right. We got one miss out of that surround. There's another miss. Another miss. Okay, so the surround was actually quite helpful this time around. Getting a few blazes here, but overall pretty good. 17 damage. That was a good roll. Alright, easy peasy. So now, depending on the encounter rates, we might get one more level on Bianca here. Oh, nope, not even gonna fight it. Okay. <laughs> so level 6 Bianca, level 6 hero is typically where you uh, where you aim to be for the speedrun. She's very close to level 7. Yeah, and the main reason level 6 is key is that gives Bianca enough MP to cast Surround and then nearly kill the boss with, uh, with Blaze. And depending on how much time you spend healing with the hero during that fight, once she runs out of MP, it's just a couple more hits of the boomerang to, to finish it off, assuming he's been able to get some damage uh, chipped in there over the course of the fight. So the, the boss ghost fight itself is fairly straightforward. He's got 200 HP, and then he's kind of on a, a semi-set rotation. It's like each turn he has uh, a, a choice of two abilities to choose from, and it just goes through that rotation. So it's not exactly the same every time, but you always know what could be coming up on any given turn as long as you're paying attention. What we want to see a lot is uh, sap and then missing with physical attacks. So that's the that's the key one. His most of his damage is going to come from uh, we'll casting blaze or fireball. That is quite yeah. the encounter. <laughs> oh my goodness! Huh. That's a that's a slow encounter if you stay in fight. <laughs> all right, so we're going to put uh, tactics set to go all out here, and Bianca's going to start off with surround and then she's going to start casting blaze now one interesting thing if you do get bianca to level seven here and she learns defense then after you use that on the boss even if you put her on tactics she's not going to use blaze anymore she'll actually try to uh, physical attack him and hit him for one damage at a time which is kind of crazy so if you do end up getting her to level seven you have to actually manually control her here which is a little bit slower but that's not too bad Fireball there, so we're gonna get a heal on Bronco. Nice. Right, so we're gonna get one more blaze out of Bianca, and then she's gonna be defending for the rest. Trying to soak up as many hits as she can. Defending and healing. Good room to heal. is down. I don't I didn't see how many herbs are left on hero here, but having not used one must be out and whoo! Nail biter. There we go. <laughs> Just enough. But anyone you walk away from is a win. Actually Bianca dying there saves a little bit of time because she would have leveled up and then you would have had to sit through that text, so very minor time save having Bianca die at the end there. Yeah, I think most of Moko's herbs were on Bianca there, so once Bianca died, it was uh, it was a little bit scary. So here we get the golden orb, which uh, Bianca's like, oh, this must be a reward, let's take it. Head back to Al Kappa, wake up in the morning, and go get our cat right away. So... This is Barongo. He's a uh, he's a panther cub that introduces the mechanic of monster taming in this game. Um, because of the way that giving commands to monsters works, we'll never actually have full control over what Barongo does. Uh, 
it's really r pretty simple. As soon as a, a recruited monster has at least 20 intelligence, uh, they'll respond to your commands, no matter what you tell them to do. Uh, however, Brongo's never going to get there. I, I'm, I don't even know if you stayed in Gen 1 for a while and level him up. I don't know what his intelligence growth looks like. I don't know if he would ever actually listen to you. But we're definitely not going to get that far uh, in the speedrun here. Alright, so here, just selling off Bianca's equipment. Uh, pick up some Holy Waters and a Chimera Wing to use down the road. Hand off some herbs. And then we're going to head back home with Papa's. And this is where Bianca leaves the party. Goodbye, Bianca. Thank you very much for your service. But now we have Barongo. We don't need Blaze anymore. It's a really good walk. Okay, just no encounters all the way home. <laughs> As long as your money situation is good, then you actually don't want to see encounters there. If you're missing a little bit, then yeah, it, it can be useful to get a fight there. It really all depends on what you like to do in the upcoming shop sequence. I uh, I used to try to make sure that I had enough gold to buy the scale armor, which is like 360 gold. And if things don't go well in the castle, then sometimes you... Just don't have enough for that. I got to a point where I started buying just a wooden hat and the leather armor. Uh, it's nearly the same defensive value total and saves you some money, so you're pretty much always going to be able to afford that. But we'll see what Moko does. So story-wise right now, we wake up and people are feeling a bit of a chill in the air and there's some mischievous events going on in town, but nobody can figure out what's going on. It turns out that that little invisible fairy on the left side there is the one making all the ruckus, trying to get people's attention, but you're the only one that's able to see her. So she's like, oh, great, you can see me. I need your help. Come meet me in the basement of the only house in town that has a basement. How convenient. That's our house. And then she's going to take us with her to the fairy kingdom to help out her people who are stuck in an eternal winter. long transition. There we go. Alright, so we're immediately greeted by Bella. This was the fairy that was back in Santa Rosa. She's going to take us to Powen, their leader. And uh, she lets us know that the Horn of Winter has... Wait, Horn, Horn of Spring, sorry. <laughs> has been taken by uh, somebody and sends us to go find it. Uh, it turns out that it was taken by the Ice Queen, but we aren't quite able to reach her yet because she's behind a locked door. So we're going to make a bit of a detour. We're going to go to the Dwarf Cave and learn the secrets of the key. Uh, so it's effectively the thief key of this game. However, it doesn't actually take up an inventory slot, which is huge because we don't get a bag yet. <laughs> the bag still has not been introduced into the series. Uh, there's actually one monster that we're going to be recruiting later on, specifically for bag space. <laughs> We're basically going to kill it off so it doesn't level up and just keep throwing things in its coffin. Alright, so we're buying the Stone Fang here for Barongo. Sell a little bit so that we can afford the scale armor, it looks like. That's going to happen at the shop outside here. Yeah, there's always room in your brownie. <laughs> We got 350 for the scale armor. Yeah, the skeleton in the bath is awesome. I don't think kicking a cat is quite the same as petting a dog, but 
I guess in the sense that they're interacting with an animal in some way. I, I guess it's similar. I think the similarities kind of end there. All right, now this cave, uh, really all we want is to get down to the bottom, learn the secrets of the key. Uh, and then there's a couple of chests down there that uh, one has some gold in it, one has a life force nut. Which, depending on how risky you want to play this, sometimes, you know, you're, you're willing to death warp before getting those. But I expect we're probably getting both of them today. That uh, that life force nut is generally saved for Pierre in Gen, in Gen 2 to give a little bit more HP when we start. so far. Nice, got an herb drop there. Can't argue with bonus healing. Yeah, so here we're staying on ag aggressive tactics. Um, Baranga's basically going to attack no matter what. Uh, if you remember Orin from Dragon Quest IV, uh, Chapter IV. <laughs> That, uh, it seems like a really good thing when he's just sitting there obliterating everything, but it actually becomes problematic when we want a Death Warp, because he's gonna start attacking the things that we're trying to die to, so... <laughs> so, Bronco's kind of an interesting one. And then, Bella's usually gonna cast Fireball on, uh, on groups of enemies, but her single-target physical attack is pretty decent as well. Is there a dungeon reverb? Maybe. I don't think so. Yeah, I played this game a lot, but I usually space, like, tune out the sounds. <laughs> there might be a little bit. Alright, so there we grabbed the uh, agility seed from that chest. Um, Basically, there's, uh, like, when we get at to the end of Gen 1, the only things that we're going to take with us into Gen 2 are the items that are in the hero's inventory. And there's a little bit of wiggle room there to, you know, take things that you prefer. Uh, like, there's a strength seed later that you can bring. You can bring this agility seed. Uh, the key thing is that we want to bring uh, two life force nuts. Uh, we want to bring a uh, chimera wing and a couple of items to sell. But, uh... It, it really comes down to runner preference on a couple of the item slots there, which is one of the things I really like about this run. There's a lot of customization to it. There's a lot of different flavor to the way that different runners play the game. So you can always, like, you'll, you can watch ten different people run this game, and, like, half of the run will be customized to their liking. It's a little bit different each time. Alright, so this chest is the Secrets of the Key, which, again, thankfully does not take an inventory slot. But we are now able to open these wooden doors. And then these two chests have gold, and then the other life force nut that we want to bring with us to Gen 2. And then once we've got these chests, uh, Mocha's gonna take off their armor and try to death warp if Barongo will let us. And this is always where the encounter rate just goes to zero. <laughs> you're fighting things all the way here and then just can't find anything when you're trying to die. So, here you see Barongo's attacking because he will not listen to us. He's completely wild. He's, he's, he's gonna do his best to slow us down. Alright. So, again, similar to uh, how things were with Bianca, we really only need Hero to die here. There's no downside if Barongo and Bella also die. They're gonna revive. Uh, after the Death Warp anyway. Don't have to go to the church or anything. Um, but now that Barongo's out of the way, it's it's just a waiting game. <laughs> we don't have to worry about this, uh, this little baby dragon dying anymore. Just you keep sitting here using the first item in your inventory. So remember in uh, Dragon Quest IV, the Death Warps involved attacking your own characters. You can't actually attack your party members in this game. So if you're trying to Death Warp, all you can do is sit there like, grab your leather hat or whatever you're wearing and wave it around and do nothing. 
<laughs> so you just grab a piece of equipment and use it, and then it does nothing and skips your turn. But now that we've got the secrets of the key, we are able to access the Ice Palace. And that is going to be our next destination. Yeah, the DQ5 movie was pretty interesting. I was totally on board with it, even with the differences, like, for the first, like, 90% of the movie. And for those who haven't seen the, haven't seen it and intend to, I'm not gonna say anything about the end of it, but... <laughs> it, uh... It definitely lost me near the end. But overall, it was a fun movie. Alright, so here's the, another spot where we're using a half-tile glitch. If you enter the door there on the middle, and you never let go of the D-pad while you're changing directions, you actually have some control over where you go on this, and you can basically skip the ice puzzle. Uh, this encounter is very unfortunate. <laughs> you don't normally get encounters in here. Yeah, the movie uh, was on Netflix, I think. Bonus level, so we'll get a little bit more damage. Learned the boggy spell. That's a whoosh. Infernos. Alright, coming down these stairs, we still have the ice walking glitch here, so a little bit of control. Skip the whole thing. I'm really glad I never had to learn any of these ice puzzles, because I hate ice puzzles. All right, so this is uh, this is Zale. He is the minion of the Ice Queen, and he's actually the one that took the uh, the Herald of Spring. So we're gonna start off with Bella casting defense twice here to get his defense down, and then uh, basically just hope that he doesn't cast his MP drain. Uh, the more he MP drains during this fight, the harder the Ice Queen fight is gonna be because you go straight into it. There's an 11 MP drain right there from uh, I, think it, I think it drained from Bella kind of unfortunate. Bella's your primary healer in the next fight, because she's very fast and has a lot of starting MP. And then Hero's kind of a backup uh, healer, because he's slower, isn't always going to outspeed uh, Ice Queen, so spot healing is best done by Bella, because you can fairly reliably get it uh, before Ice Queen attacks here. Alright, so same thing here again. We're going to start off trying to get two defense casts. Ooh, it resisted the first one. That's not good. Alright, there's one. And the Ice Queen is on a, a, a set pattern, so you always know what action she's going to do next, which very is very fortunate because it lets you go all out on turns where, you know, she's not going to do anything. Alright, so we got both defenses, and uh, now it's basically just managing our health. Uh, her next ability is going to be a heal. And then she's going to take a deep breath, which is going to result in a huge hit on one target on the next turn. So, I want to make sure everybody's topped off here. And she's going to hit Barongo. Right, and then she's just going to do a Ice Breath that hits everybody for a little bit. It's not too bad. And then another attack. And then she's going to do an Ice Bolt on the next turn. And then she's back to Heal and then Deep Breath. So it's, it's a very comfortable pattern. You know, you, you never get surprised by an ability, unless you just forget where you are in the pattern. <laughs> Which definitely happens. I, I've, I may or may not have lost a few runs to spacing out and not knowing where she was. Yeah, and here we're feeling the effects of uh, that MP drain from Zale. Yep, lost Barango here. It's okay, we've got some decent damage, so we still got a shot here. Bella's got one more heal cast left. Uh, Zale also always drops a magic water, which restores like 10 to 15 MP. So, uh, in a pinch, Hero can use that and uh, get some more healing for that fight. But another very close boss fight. Uh, you, you, you may have noticed that the fights in this game are a little bit tight. 
Just a little bit of bad RNG. Oh my goodness, another encounter in here? This is so unusual. Like, you, you never see one encounter in here, let alone two. Uh, if you're asking if the moveset is always the same, yes, she always starts at the same point and uh, goes in the same order. Uh, and that's true of most of the bosses in the run. You'll pretty much always know what ability is coming out. Uh, there's a few exceptions, like Zale doesn't always follow the same pattern. You don't always get the MP drains, but most of the enemies, you, you've got a pretty good idea of what's coming up. Some of them have choices between a couple of abilities on each turn, but you, if you know the pattern, then you know which abilities it can choose between, so you can prepare for uh, worst case scenario. And since we uh, recovered the Herald of Spring here, bring it back to Powen, and our quest here is done. Uh, yes, I, I'm Arrow Verdo. I'm I'm just doing the commentary. Uh, Mokopoid is doing the run. And we get sent back home into our basement back in Santa Rosa. Uh, we're going to come upstairs and Sancho, who we're going to see a bit later in the run, and we are going to absolutely fall in love with him. Uh, he's like, oh my gosh, where have you been? Your dad just left without you. <laughs> if you go to the church, you might catch him before he leaves. Yeah, Sancho is truly one of the heroes of this run. Like, Sancho and Pierre are basically what makes the speedrun possible. I don't know why I don't have a Sancho emote. I think I, uh, I think I need to get on my artist about that. Tell her if she gives me a Sancho emote, she doesn't have to clean her room for a week or something. <laughs> for those that don't know, my uh, my daughter makes my emotes for me. More goblin rats. All right, so that's a good chunk of money to pick up on the way to Reinhardt. So this is another spot where, um, for the most part, the gold that we need has already been picked up, and so you kind of don't want any encounters on this walk, but it never hurts to have a little bit extra gold. And this, I love this part right here. Because <laughs> Papas is in control, you know, like you're you're following him along again. You're not actually controlling this. And he goes down the stairs and goes, ah, <laughs> like I don't have any confirmation on this, but my head cannon was like that happened while they were programming it, and instead of fixing it, they just decided to make a joke out of it. All right, but here we've arrived in Reinhardt, uh, and this is where our next major story event is going to occur. Um, Papas was summoned by the King of Reinhardt, effectively to. Uh, you know, a bodyguard slash babysitter for Prince Henry, who's a bit of a jerk. Uh, nobody likes him. He likes playing pranks on people. He's extremely rude. Um, kind of reminds me of uh, Charmley in DQ8, for anybody familiar with that game. There's probably most people here. But fortunately, Henry has a bit of a redemption throughout this game. He's actually going to become our best friend and a well-adjusted individual overall. The so here Papas talks to the king, says, Oh, hey, this is some boring adult stuff. Why don't you go explore the castle and see how much you can screw up our future? He may not have said that last part, but that's basically what's going to happen here. So this is Henry. Uh, basically, it just says, Hey, you want to be my goon? Too bad. <laughs> you suck. Go away. And so we're going to leave and just talk to a few people here. We're going to learn about a... Uh, a plot where the queen is looking to dispose of Henry so that her son can become uh, can become king instead of Henry. I 
don't know the exact story situation there, but I believe it's a half brother or it's, or a step brother. One of those two. Either way, uh, her son is not the king's son. I don't think. I'm pretty sure it's a step brother situation. I haven't played this in English in, like, 15 years, so there's a lot that's missing, story-wise. <laughs> so here's the queen, and that's Dale, the, the little boy that she wants to have become king instead of Henry. And we pop up back here, talk to the king, he's like, hey, your, uh, your dad's over looking after Henry, you should go check in with him. And Papa says, since we're going to be here for a while, you might as well try to be friends with Henry. And we sigh and say, fine, Dad, I'll go talk to him again. Say, hey, yeah, I still want to be your goon. And he's like, all right, go to that chest in the next room and get the goon badge for me. However, the chest is empty. And then Henry's gone. Where could he be? If you actually walk back out past uh, Papa's, he'll be like, no, Henry hasn't come this way. And then he'll take you back into Henry's room to look for him. And Henry's sitting back at the, ch at the table again. So, you basically just repeat that loop until you actually check the stool and find the stairs underneath. And then while you're here, Henry gets kidnapped. There's just a little bit of panic here. It's like, uh, Dad, you know that kid that you've been babysitting for 75 seconds? Yeah, he just got kidnapped. <laughs> we might be in trouble. <laughs> He's going to take us back in here. He's going to find the stairs. We'll go down, head outside. We're going to do a quick shop here. Um, probably looking to get the uh, iron shield and fur hood. This is another one of the shops where there's a, there's a little bit of variance between runners, but the, the most stable shopping sequence here results in the fur hood and iron shield. The shield is a, is a must. The, the hood is kind of a, if you have enough for it. I'm going to need 1,120 gold for this shop. Yeah, I'm selling all of Barongo's stuff, because uh, we're not going to need it anymore. Uh, we're not going to be fighting anything for the rest of Gen 1. Everything's just going to be run, 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 run. So we go. Got the fur hood, got the iron shield. Really good uh, shape defensively. And then off we go to the Ancient Ruins, which is where uh, Henry's been taken, and Papa's already ran off ahead of us. Here he's the Holy Water. Uh, get some overworld walking without encounters. Uh, you can start running into Slime Knights in this area, so the overworld encounters are very, very bad. You don't want to see anything out here. So that holy water is pretty important. If you die to Ice Queen, you actually end up behind a fairy, or a holy water, because you have to use it again to get back up to the Ice Palace, and then that walk becomes kind of dangerous. All right, so these hammer hoods, uh, more often than not, they're going to miss, but they can also crit for 15 damage, and <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> you don't want to take very much damage here because we're very limited on our healing resources. Um, the dragon on the left there, those are actually the most dangerous things in here because of that fire breath. You can uh, you can run into groups of four of those, and if they all fire on the same turn, then you can just straight up lose. So a single run fail from four dragons can result in a party wipe. Step in there to reset the encounter threat. Yeah, your story was based on, on DQ5. Uh, somewhat loosely. There's some stuff in there that hits very similar, but uh, there's a, they definitely took some liberties there. Alright, so this chest has a strength seed in it, which Moko's not going to get. This is what's kind of that uh, runner preference thing I've been mentioning ad nauseum. Uh, it seems like uh, Moko doesn't really care to take the strength seed for Pierre. It doesn't make a big difference. It's really just one of those things that yeah, helps out for one encounter. It does also increase your chances of getting too many encounters in here, so not going out of your way for it is 
Never a bad idea. All right, so once we get through this doorway... Uh-oh. <laughs> Here we got the dragons. Okay, good. Everything's fine here. Nobody's on fire. Alright, so here Pappas is going to have a scripted battle, and he plays on the slowest text speed, so... This fight takes forever in speedrunning time. But once this fight's over, Pappas joins us, and at that point, you don't have to worry about Hero's HP anymore. Um, up until this point, if Hero dies, you know, you're, you're going back to Reinhardt, you have to start this whole segment over again. Uh, but now that Pappas has joined us, we're right back to what was going on at the very beginning of the game, where uh, he's going to heal us up to full HP at the end of every encounter, and that includes reviving us if we die, so... Uh, you no longer have to worry about anything. Now it's just a question of how long it takes to get to the end of here, not if you get to the end of here. And that is an encounter. <laughs> oh my. He doesn't care about Barongo, though. He's not going to heal Barongo. Uh, Barongo will still revive with 1 HP, but he's not going to take the time to heal him up. Papas is not a cat person. Yeah, the DQ 1 and 2 uh, Super Famicom remakes were uh, based on the same engine as DQ 5. So there's, there's a lot of similarities there. <laughs> Goodbye again, Brongo. Oh, we almost got to see the revive. One last encounter for the road. Once we get through this doorway, there's no more encounters for the rest of this dungeon. Uh, so you'll notice there were a couple of chests that we just kind of went past without picking them up. Uh, the reason for that is you don't want to get any extra encounters. Even though they're not dangerous, every encounter is just wasted time. So once we come through here, all of the random encounters go away. And then on our way back through, we, we stop by and pick up all of the chests. Yeah, the story reason for that is right here, Pappas is like, I'll hold off the monsters while you guys escape. And somehow, him fighting those three deals with all of the monsters in the entire dungeon. So this chest has a, an elfin elixir. It's a full MP recovery uh, single-use item. That will be held on to, most likely, until the final boss. There's not really a time that you usually end up using that. Uh, there's a chance in uh, like the Great Temple or Dragon Tower that you might end up using it, but not usually. He's so OP, you can hold off all monsters everywhere. Alright, and here we get introduced to Gemma. Uh, this is a forced death. There, there's nothing you can do at these levels to beat him. Um, if you hack the game and... Oh, nice. That was a quick death. Basically, your goal here is to die as quickly as possible. And that was about as fast as you can die here. Um, yeah, if you hack the game and actually defeat Gemma during this fight, it still comes out to this same defeat sequence. Alright, and this is... Uh, on the left, we've got Jami. And the right is Gons. These are Gemma's uh, minions. And Papas is gonna show up and fight them off. Uh, this fight is not completely scripted, so if he gets some crits, it actually speeds it up a little bit. Which is good, because he's still playing on, on a boomer tech speed. Oh, it depends. Does Ragnar have the Sword of Lethargy? <laughs> Alright, and so here Gemma's just like, oh, you defeated my minions. Well, if you want me to kill your son and have his soul roam the pits of hell for eternity, then continue fighting back. And so here, Papas, uh, the text says that he's bearing it stoically. He's basically just being beat to death in front of our eyes by Jami and Guns. And he doesn't fight back because he doesn't want Gemma to, to kill us. So this is kind of the beginning of like the the really dark tone of this game where we're just sitting here watching our father die a very brutal death. He 
he collapses. And he's still alive, tells us that our mother is still alive, and then Gemma incinerates him. And Papas is no more. And so here, uh, Gemma finds the golden orb that we found in the uh, in the castle, and says, oh, that looks important, and then destroys it. So our golden orb has been destroyed. Barango has been left to become wild once again. And Hero and Henry have been abducted into slavery to help build the great temple for the, uh, the Baramos of this game, evil. Alright, so here we are ten years later. Uh, we've been helping construct the great temple for a while. Yeah, we're going to come down here and find Henry, who over the course of the, of the past ten years has mellowed out a little bit. He's no longer a, a pain in the butt. He's actually a, a very a very nice person at this point. He's our best friend. Teaches the hero how to read. Um, that little detail is actually uh, somewhat significant because if you go up in Gen 1 to read any of the signs on the overworld, uh, it'll say that you can't read it. If you have Bella in the party, she'll read the signs and then say uh, it's like, what, can't you read, you dummy? <laughs> and just kind of berate you, make fun of you for not being able to read. Uh, but Henry teaches us how to read here. And here he just got to talk to all of the slaves in this room to progress the story. And then we're going to work on uh, executing our escape plan. Yeah, Bianca. <laughs> Bianca is just like, I know how to read. Don't you know how to read? Jeez. Gotta love Bianca. Alright, so the guard at the table right there is, uh, his name is Joshua, and his sister was the girl on the top right in the room that we just talked to. Uh, her name is Maria. She used to be a servant of the Order of Light, which is where, you know, all these monsters are from, uh, but she no longer is associated with them and got imprisoned for it. And that's her laying on the ground there being beaten by these two. Uh, Henry runs up to protect her. We join in, and uh, this is another one where it doesn't matter if you win or lose. Uh, if you win, I think you get a little bit of experience. I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> but uh, for the speedrun, we just run until we die. You can't actually escape from the fight, but just skips our action as quickly as possible. So here comes Joshua with his guards, and he's like, what's going on here? And those two tamers are just like, yeah, these uh, these slaves are being all uppity, so we beat the crap out of them. And Joshua realizes that's his sister, realizes that we helped uh, protect her, and tells them to throw us in prison. And so here, while we're sitting in prison, Joshua and, uh, and Maria come up and finalize our escape here. It's just like... Because Joshua tells us at this point that at, when the uh, Great Temple has been completed, the plan is for all of the slaves to be disposed of. And he doesn't want his sister to die, so... He's just like, take her with you, get out of here. Be go be free. And off we go. Down the, the fastest barrel ride of all time. Snack sounds good, Ash. <laughs> Alright, so here we wash up at this nunnery by the sea. Uh, this nun tells us we've been asleep for three days. Which sounds great. I could go for a three-day nap right about there. Uh, but we got all of our equipment back. Any gold that we had at the end of Gen 1. We got it all back. So here's Maria. Having washed her hair, she is now a vibrant blonde. And she gives us a thousand gold that Joshua gave her because she's like, well, I'm just going to join the nunnery, so I don't actually need this money. So you take this thousand gold. And we're like, sweet, speedrunners love easy gold. So we're going to take that and go. And I don't know 
know exactly why Henry cares so much, but at this point he goes back inside to tell everybody that we're leaving so they can give us a send-off. It's like, well, can we just go? <laughs> and we are almost into the actual game, finally. Hour and ten minutes, we're basically through the intro of the game. Uh, we're going to make a quick stop up here at Oracle Belly. Oracle Belly? Oracle Berry. English is difficult, I apologize. Uh, we're going to go up to the casino and steal a couple of items. There's a silk robe and a silver tiara, I believe they are. Uh, we're going to pick these up to sell uh, in order to get a weapon for Henry, and then also pay for a wagon, which is going to allow us to start recruiting monsters. Also, I love the casino music in this game. <laughs> it's so good. Alright, I'm gonna sneak off to the right here. There's a defense seed upstairs in this shop that's gonna give us four more defense. Still a little bit more stability. And passes the, uh, the iron shield over to Henry. So up here we're selling the items that we stole from the casino. Uh, it's going to give us uh, about 1,500 gold here. We're going to spend 1,200 on this chain whip. That's going to go to Henry. Uh, that's similar to the boomerang. It hits multiple targets, but only within a single group. So basically like what you see with the uh, like Dragon Quest three whips and such. So here, we're, is, this is very similar to the castle walking in Dragon Quest IV to progress the day-night cycle. However, it is way harder than in Dragon Quest IV because Dragon Quest V has half tiles. So it's checking twice as often to see if you accidentally hit up or down. So it is so easy to just accidentally re-enter town or walk off and get encounters. <laughs> I screw that up every single time. Like every once in a while I get a, a decent one, but it is so much harder than it is in, in Dragon Quest IV. So right there in that pot, we grabbed a monster lure, which is going to sell for 150 gold. And then up in this shop, this guy is selling a wagon for 3,000 gold. However, for some reason, he decides that he's going to haggle for you and drop the cost down to 300. We're like, uh, okay, I'll take it. And then that Chimera Wing that we brought from Gen 1 is used right there. So now we have this wagon, and we have our very own party horse. And uh, at this point, we can start recruiting monsters. Uh, what we're looking for, first off, is a blue slime, which is going to be key to a lot of the strategies later on. Uh, it's going to learn spells like Increase, uh, Defense, uh, Confuse, and... Oh, man. There's a, there's a fourth one in there that I always forget when I'm talking about it. <laughs> what am I... What am I forgetting? There's a fourth one in there, and it's important, I promise. Uh, and then the other thing that we're looking for here is recruiting one of absolutely anything else. And that character is primarily going to be Bagspace. Oh my gosh, what spell am I forgetting? Increase, decrease. Use. Oh yeah, Expel. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, Expel comes in very handy in a lot of uh, situations. So the way that monster recruiting works is every monster has a... Uh, a set percent chance to join uh, after combat. However, the game will only check the last recruitable monster that dies uh, to see if the recruit is successful. Now, in this case, both of these monsters are recruitable. However, the Hammerhood has a 50% chance to recruit, <laughs> and the Bag has a much lower chance to recruit, so we don't want to take that chance. Uh, here, the Dragon is not recruitable, so it doesn't matter what order we kill these in. Uh, only the slime is incredible in, th in this encounter, and it's going to be another 50% chance here. First try. Welcome to the party, Slalin. 
All right, so that is one of three recruits out of the way. We still need our dummy character, which again, can be absolutely anything. Um, it's going to spend most of the game dead just carrying our items around for us. Uh, the third monster that we're going to recruit is Pierre the Slime Knight, and he is, like, he's the main character of this speedrun. If you've seen a Dragon Quest V speedrun, you've seen Pierre. <laughs> he's the star of the show here. I think I have a bit of a delay. I shouldn't. Hope not. Oh well. <laughs> not much you can do there. So the secondary objective that we've got going on in this segment is getting Henry up to level 6. Uh, that just has to happen before we reach the imposter boss fight. And the reason for level 6 is that's when he's going to learn the defense spell. Looks like it's a head. That's interesting. I'll, I'll try to pause then. <laughs> yeah, Pierre was a permanent member of my party uh, when I first played through this casually. Like, you immediately realize how overpowered he is. He, can, he he's got healing magic. He's got the ability. He's got really high HP, really high defense. He's got a good chunk of MP. He can equip really good armor, really good weapons. It's just in every way superior to basically everything else you can get in this game. Like if you could just get a, a full group of Pierres, it would be a lot of fun. All right, so up here, Henry's gonna be like, hey, I know you wanna look for your mom, but I need to go back to my country and see what's going on there. Because apparently everything in Reinhardt has kinda fallen apart uh, ever since Dale took over. So we're gonna come here and do a little bit of shopping. Uh, the main goal here, we're gonna pick up some uh, Chimera wings that are gonna be used to uh, travel around a bit. You know, unlike Dragon Quest IV, you don't get to choose your destination when you use the Chimera Wings in this game. They're just going to take you to the last town that you were at. Um, but we're going to be using those to get around until we learn the return spell, which will actually allow us to select our destination. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, we're just buying a whole bunch of Chimera Wings, and Slalom's going to be holding onto those. Then we're also stocking up on a lot of herbs. Uh, these herbs are going to be very important because there's a sequence uh, once we get to Reinhardt where we're going to go underground and have to go all the way through that dungeon and keep e at least keep Henry alive. And we're going to use all of our healing in there. It is incredibly dangerous. It's threat to level wise. It's one of the hardest parts of the entire run. Like, so much so that I actually, I started testing out a different gold routing and weapon routing just specifically to cut out some steps in the underground. <laughs> it's that bad. It's like, like, I will change the way I play this entire game up to this point to try to cut out two random encounters. Yeah, a little bit of a delay. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll I'll try to comment on things a little bit after they happen so I don't spoil you with commentary. Uh, down here, uh, we're picking up a scale shield for Hero and a wooden hat for uh, for Henry. And off we go back to Reinhardt. Decent encounter. Not too dangerous, but worth a good chunk of experience. Yeah, the, the mushrooms by themselves aren't that bad. Uh, they can put you to sleep, but they don't really deal a whole lot of damage, especially after uh, getting that extra armor in the shop there. Alright, and once we... Uh, once we cross this river, we are going to be in the encounter zone that has the Slime Knights. And everything's kind of on hold until you recruit your Slime Knight. <laughs> I, uh, I had a run in, uh, in a marathon about a year ago where we were here for 30 minutes. It was, it was pretty bad. So we just did not want to join. The Slime Knight has a 25% chance to join. So keep that in mind. It's it's 25%. That seems pretty good, right? There's no way that can take too long. But if you're really grinding for a really good time in this game, 
this is probably where you're going to reset the most, just because the game will not give you a Slime Knight. Yeah, 28-ish. That sounds about right. It, it was in the upper 20s. <laughs> Step into Reinhardt here. Oh, nope. I usually step in that way if you die, you end up in there. Hey, look, it's Pierre. All right, so the Yeti is recruitable here, so it's important to make sure that the Yeti dies first. Um, it's important to note how dangerous these encounters are. The Owlbear on the left there deals a lot of damage. The Yeti can shout and stun the party and just take away your actions. And the Slime Knights deal a good chunk of damage, they can crit for about 40 damage, and they can heal. So these fights are far from simple. Um, basically what uh, the strategy on these fights is, is you're going to have Hero cast Upper on, on himself and then also on Henry, so that the only real threat uh, is getting crits like, like that. <laughs> and, uh, and then you're just going to start pecking everything down. Oh yeah, and the Slime Knights can also MP steal. So you want to make sure you get those uppers super early. You, like you, you, those have to be the first thing that you do, because sometimes all of your MP just evaporates after the first round. Now since the Yeti is recruitable, you gotta make sure that the Yeti dies first. We want the Slime Knight to be the last thing to die here. And then we get a 25% shot on Slime Knight number one. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, you get the first try, Pierre. Marathon lock. There you go. So that's a very good. That's that's huge. All right. So right away we uh, pass the the life force nuts over to Pierre. Get his HP up. Oh man. That is so lucky. Alright, so passing Henry's bronze knife over to Pierre so that he's got some attack power. Um, oh, not going for the safety save. I tend to uh, go in and do a safety save here, unless I'm like really pushing for a fast time, but. Mocha must be very confident. So down here, the encounters are awful. And that's... it's... yeah, they're awful. <laughs> You've got the turtle dragons, which have super high defense. You've got forks, which aren't too bad. They, they just have a lot of HP, so they take a while to kill if you, if you fight them. Uh, those magician encounters, they can cast fireball. And basically what you do throughout here is you just run. You try to run from everything and then hope that you have enough healing to uh, push to carry everybody through to the end. There are some encounters in here that I'll fight, uh, particularly if you just get like a couple of forks, because those are worth a ton of experience. And we do still want to make sure that we're getting Henry up to level 6. And right here you'll see Henry is currently level 4, so we've got two levels to go on Henry. Yeah, so this one, since there's only two of them, uh, Mocha's gonna fight him, get some of that experience here. Now, Pierre has six starting MP, uh, so he's, he can cast heal twice, but he does have uh, that MP drain. So, up against those magician enemies, he can drain some of their MP to get it back, so... You can get a, you can get a little bit... A little bit more longevity there. All right, these inspectors are annoying because they just they blind the party, cast surround, and they actually deal a decent amount of damage. Like I never respected their damage for the longest time, and then I realized one day when they killed me, I was just like, okay, they hurt. <laughs> but they spend most of their time just trying to blind you. All right, so we are taking this fight, uh, mostly because those horks are worth so much damage. Or damage experience. 
So we're gonna focus down the Slime Knight. And of course it heals itself. Call in some reinforcements there. <laughs> that Slime Knight does not want to stop healing. And drained 10 MP. Alright, so this is going to be a ton of experience here. 268. Hero gets to level 10. Henry gets to level 5. And then getting the first couple of levels on Pierre helps out quite a bit as well. Alright, so we are out of MP at this point, so this is where the herbs that we picked up during the shopping sequence in El Kappa comes in handy. Because that's now all the healing that we have left. So this part right here, going off to the left through this, this is the part that my alternate routing attempted to cut out, but ultimately I, I had trouble balancing it with the mid-game. Uh, taking this extra step out here to get the, the Shell Hat and the Steel Fang, which are equipable by Slalin, uh, but also sell for a decent amount, uh, this puts you in a situation where you're going to get a few extra encounters. And with how dangerous the encounters in this area are, it, it's pretty risky. Alright, so this fight should get Henry up to level 6, at which point random encounters are pretty much done, uh, as far as immediate value. There we go. Yep, we got to level 6, learns the decrease spell. Decrease defense, what's it called in uh, modern Dragon Quest? It's the... Uh, Group defense lowering. <laughs> Kasap, I think. I'm not good with modern DQ names. It is Kasap. Okay. Yeah, like Sap, I know. But then, like, once there's a you know, put Ka in front of it, I'm just like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm going out of my way to say some form of the English names of the spells. I I think about spells in Dragon Quest games using the Japanese spell names, and so it's really hard for me to not say them. But since most people probably know them by their modern DQ names, I'm trying to use those. Bazing. Oh gosh. Alright, so at this point, we're just trying to get to the end of this uh, this dungeon with Henry alive. Henry needs to be alive to trigger the next story sequence. Um, the good news is that if he does die, we're going to open up a shortcut that uh, will allow us to come back in after reviving him, but that's still going to be a time loss if you have to, if you have to head out. So Hero unfortunately died on that encounter. So we're passing some equipment around to tank up Pierre now, since Hero doesn't need them. <laughs> Already running very low on herbs here. So this is where encounter rate really becomes the key to success. Okay. And getting lucky with first uh, first try runs. Oh boy. All right, so here with uh, with the triple Yeti encounter, if they all sit there shouting, then it's multiple chances per turn to uh, stun your party and take away their actions. Fortunately, we got away. And we're almost through here. Uh, just a bit further south here, you're going to see some stairs once we, uh, once we get out of this encounter. And... Those stairs are going to take us to the final hallway, which leads to the button that opens the shortcut and then the stairs that it, uh, get us out of here. It's a huge relief once you hit that shortcut button, and then more relief a few steps later once you leave. Alright, so here the, that bird on the left 
uh, can cast decrease. A sap. There we go. That's <laughs> we just talked about that one. <laughs> My brain refuses to permanently store modern Dragon Quest spell names. Really? So this star button up here opens the shortcut, and then we get on out. And here we're going to see the first instance where the game makes sure that the hero is always alive when you go to town, which is wonderful. So if hero's dead and you enter a town, it'll say that the next uh, next up active character will say that they, they dragged your body to the church and, and revived you. So you don't actually have to go out of your way to revive hero ever in this game. Uh, it still costs money, so you can very quickly run out of money if you have to do that too much. Because it doesn't tell you it's taking money, it just takes it away in the background. Alright, so up here we go talk to Dale, who is now king, and Henry's like, Hey yo, it's me, ya boy. And Dale is like, oh great, here, have this Reinhardt key give you access to the treasury to get some stuff, and uh, go figure out what's going on with my mom. Because it turns out that the Empress has uh, kind of been pulling the strings here ever since the King's death, and Dale's not really in charge of anything. It actually turns out that she it has been replaced by a an imposter monster. You may have noticed while we were in the underground, we walked past a cell that had a very queenly looking character in there. That was actually uh, Dale's mother in there. Alright, so in the, uh, in the treasury there, we got another life force nut. We got a uh, half plate armor and 1500 gold. Armor is going to go to Pierre. Uh, life force nut is going to go to Pierre. Uh, Some stuff here. We're also getting the, uh, the steel sword for Pierre. So Pierre is tanking up, gearing up, getting ready to go. And even though he's only like level 3 or 4 at this point, yeah, he's level 3. He's already ready to carry this party through the rest of the game. Uh, yeah, so one important detail for uh, damage tiles in this game is they can't actually kill you. So, since we're using the inn immediately after that, you can freely walk on those tiles and uh, you don't have to worry about anybody dying. And so Mocha is picking up a, a couple of holy waters here. So in Dragon Quest IV, throwing holy waters at metal slimes would deal like 10 to 15 damage and instantly kill them. Yeah, you just hover at 1 HP. Um, in this game, they kind of fixed that, but they also broke other things. There's, there's a, a glitch associated with stuff, <laughs> which we'll get into later. But... Uh, holy waters will always hit metal enemies for one damage in this game. Also, most Dragon Quest games, Metal Slimes have 3 or 4 HP. In this game, they can actually have between 3 and 5 HP. Which is a little bit brutal, considering your party size is only 3 in this version. Uh, in the PS2 and DS remakes, you get 4 characters in your party. But in the original, you only get 3 party members. So, having Metal Slimes with 5 HP is actually kind of brutal. <laughs> Excuse me. Alright, so while we're here, we're stopping by to pick up Maria, because she is going to effectively act as a key uh, to the Tower of God, which is our next destination. Um, it requires basically somebody from this nunnery to, uh, to open the door. 
Yeah, in, in the remake, you can have the whole family together, but not the original. It is kind of funny. Like, yeah, you gotta leave somebody out in the original. And so here, there's a little bit of a trick uh, with the day-night cycle. Uh, once we get out of the tower, we're gonna want it to be daytime, so that we can use the portal that goes back to Reinhardt. However, if we just go to the tower right now, it's not gonna be... It's, it's still gonna be night when we finish the tower. So here you save and then reset the game. And then when you reload, it instead of it being at the beginning of night, it advances the time to midnight. So once we get out of the... Or actually, before we even get to the tower, it's already going to be day. Alright, so here we still don't have our dummy character, so... We do actually want to take this fight and see if we can recruit this Hammerhead. And this is going to be a 50% chance recruit. After Henry levels up. Oh no. <laughs> oh, still none. Alright, we got another shot here. Yeah, and one interesting detail about uh, monster recruits is every monster, in addition to having their own percent chance to be successfully recruited, uh, they also have a minimum hero level requirement. So that comes in handy later in the run because you're not going to waste time to monsters trying to join us later in the run because heroes never going to be high enough level for like any of like mid to late game monster recruits. But it also means that we kind of need to knock out recruiting the dummy character as early as possible here. Let's see if we get the apple. No apple. Okay. Yeah, so normally what you would be doing in this situation, if you already had all of your recruits out of the way, is you would just have Pierre out by himself because he's really tanky and just oh try God. to run from everything. But oh my gosh, you're almost dying. <laughs> but uh, if, if you're still trying to find your dummy character, you really gotta just take all these fights trying to get a recruit. Oh my goodness. Alright, so in this tower, we can find metal slimes. This is the first place where we can encounter them. Uh, and that's why Moko picked up a couple of... Um, a couple of holy waters. It's guaranteed one damage if you throw the holy water. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, it, it's kind of funny. You get the first try, Pierre, but then lose like 10 50 50s <laughs> trying to get your dummy character. Oh. Oh, man. We got the metal slimes and they ran away. That's unfortunate. So, since we can start encountering metal slimes, I, I briefly mentioned a glitch when, when Mocha was buying them that, uh,. That in involves really any enemy, but you only ever see it with Metal Slimes. So basically, when you're targeting a, an enemy with a Holy Water, if that target dies before the Holy Water goes out, and then the Holy Water doesn't successfully retarget over to another enemy, then the Holy Water will actually hit the dead enemy, bring it back to life, and kill it again. And you will get double experience. Uh, this is actually banned because they're away in the normal any percent route because you can exploit that to endlessly kill metal slimes if you're if you're lucky. <laughs> and so if that happens, you kind of just gotta run away and not and just lose it. Um, but it, it, the reason you mostly see it with metal slimes is because uh, during the metal slime quote unquote grind, which is very optional in this game. Um, you 
generally have a poison needle on slalom, and so sometimes you get the instant kill from the poison needle, and then the holy water re-kills that target. Uh, so the Metal Slime Recruit was actually not in this version. I think that's DS exclusive. I'm not sure if you can get it in the PS2 version. Um, you can recruit a Metal Babel in this game, but it's a 1 in 256 chance. So, extremely unlikely. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that part whenever I get around to doing my Recruit All Monsters playthrough. That's, that's gonna be a nightmare. All right, so up at the top of the tower there, we uh, we grabbed the the raw mirror, which, as with other games in uh, in the series, reveals the true identity of whoever looks into it. So we're gonna take that back to Reinhardt and uh, expose the imposter queen for the monster that she is. Then we're gonna kick her butt right out of Reinhardt and restore peace to the land. Not the raw mirror, I guess. <laughs> this mirror is thoroughly cooked. Alright, so this is why we want it to be day. If you come here at night, uh, in order to keep you from getting into the nighttime version of Reinhardt, there's actually an old man sitting in that one tile gap and does not let you uh, get past. So that's why we did the whole save and reset thing to manipulate the, the time of day. So we can just come right on up here and not have to walk around outside to progress the day-night cycle. And over here in this pot, there is a tiny metal, which in this game you can sell tiny metals. Uh, I think it's 225 gold. So we picked that up for just a little bit of uh, extra spending money. We don't actually collect tiny metals for getting equipment from the Metal King, but that one is worth grabbing to make sure that we can afford the, the magic shield in the uh, port zombie. And up here, you can see we've got both of the queens up here. The one from the cell in the underground has been brought up. And use that raw mirror and go straight into a boss fight here. So the imposter has 300 HP, uh, and she can summon monsters, but her first, she's on a cycle for uh, for what she does here, so you're going to start off by having uh, Henry cast Kasap. <laughs> by the end of this run, I'll, I'll remember Kasap right off the top of my head. Uh, get her defense down, and then start picking off things as they spawn. And then she's also going to do a big hit here on everybody, and... Normally you'll you'll time a heal. Yeah, okay. So she uh, Henry used the earth there on Hero since Henry was still alive. And then basically this is just managing ads and burning down the boss as quickly as possible with the extra level uh, on Pierre from all the extra fights trying to recruit a dummy that actually went down pretty quick. So you, you get a few extra levels on this fight and it's it's pretty easy. It's not usually a like a, a problem in a speed run, but there are times where she can get kind of trolly if she keeps summoning ads, especially if the um, the the goodie bag ad that she summons uh, has stop spell and then you can't heal anymore. Uh, this this run is. You know, generally in like the the five to six hour range. Um, I think the current world record is 4:40. I don't, I don't, I know Mofa Fluffy got the 4:45. I don't know if he got the 4:44, and he's been he's been trying. <laughs> uh, the Japanese name of the spell is Rukanon. Uh, it's Rukani for Sap, Rukanon for Kasap. So here we're, we're selling the steel fang that we picked up in the underground, picking up the poison needle, and that's going to be equipped on Slalin to take a shot at one-shotting metal slimes. So our next, uh, our next primary goal is returning to the town of Santa Rosa. Uh, 
which is where we started out the game. And we're going to go back into the cave that we went into as a child. But this time we're going to go in via the boat and access a different section of the cave. And in that cave, we're going to find uh, the Zenithian sword at the very bottom. But along the way, we're hoping to find some metal slimes. Uh, they're in no way required for the speed run, but they definitely make the rest of the run safer. Especially the upcoming volcano, which if you've seen this run, you know that the volcano is terrible. <laughs> um, so we we like to get some metal slimes in there, but if you don't get any, it's not the end of the world. Uh, the poison needle insta insta kill is it's either one in eight or one in sixteen. I think it's one in sixteen, but sometimes it feels like one in eight. I don't know exactly. It's it's not too bad though. Yeah, Gen one taking about an hour is uh is, is pretty average gen 2 which is uh what we're in now has a lot of setup this is kind of where like a lot of the bulk of the game is this is like two two and a half hours and then gen 3 which is you know mostly just the end game it's mostly just you know boss fight boss fight boss fight uh, for a good chunk of it is about another two hours or so Um, part of that, yeah, like, you don't need all of that experience on Henry, but more importantly, you want the experience on Pierre. So Pierre is so key to the rest of this run, uh, in particular in the Volcano, he's gonna solo the boss. That's how, that's how good Pierre is. And he can do that at, like, at level 4 if you have to, but, um, if you can get Pierre up to, like, level 10 or 11, then... It greatly increases your chances of success in there. Like, if I'm going for, like, a PB attempt, then... However many Metal Slimes I've killed by the time I get to the Zenithian Sword, that's it. <laughs> if I'm going for stability for, like, a marathon run, I'll usually try to get three or four Metal Slimes to get Pierre up to, like, level 10 or 11 before leaving here. Uh, we'll see what, uh, what Malko's gonna do here. Sometimes you just don't find any Metal Slimes at all. And that gets frustrating. This is the worst encounter to get in here. <laughs> Believe it or not, eight blue slimes is the worst encounter. And the reason for that is if you fail to run, you have to sit through all of their attack animations. And if you decide to fight them, you have to sit through all of the damage animations. <laughs> it's just, it's a no-win scenario unless you just run on the first try. It's just a huge waste of time. Yeah, there we got a Metal Slime, but it ran away. So here you can see um, where we're walking is leaving some marks on the ground. What that's actually doing is causing the ceiling in the room below us to crumble. And that's dropping a dirt path over a pool of water. So this path that we take here um, gives us access to everything that we're looking for. The stairs down and then also over to uh, a couple of chests on the right side. Uh, the chests have a agility seed and an iron breastplate, which... Um, nobody we have can equip. That's just going to be sold. <laughs> oh, Metal Slime number two runs. <laughs> yeah, Pierre is absolutely the true hero of this story. If Pierre were not as good as he is, this would be an extremely different run. Um, Gen 2 in particular it would be way different. Gen 3 would probably include actually using your son. Oh. <laughs> <Bravo>. <laughs> All right, we're not having cooperative metal slimes so far. No, these ones don't combine. Uh, you, you don't get metal or you don't get slime kings in here. Well, the good news is we're seeing metal slimes, and uh, ah. <laughs> That time we got the, the poison needle. It's very good. Right. Metal slime number one there. So one of the fun things is, you may remember all the way back at the beginning of the run when we got Barongo, I mentioned 
Uh, monsters following orders is based on their intelligence. Once they have 20 intelligence, they'll listen to all of your commands. Uh, until then, they, they're kind of random. So Slalin doesn't hit 20 intelligence till around level 10 or 11. Hey, hey, we got the brownie, so now we have our dummy. That was a very good encounter. So early in the Metal Slime grind, Slalin doesn't always listen. And there are times when you'll tell him to attack a Metal Slime. And then instead he'll attack an Owlbear. And you'll get the Poison Needle proc. And it's just like, man, if only you had just listened to me, we'd have a Metal Slime. <laughs> but now with Slalin at level 11, uh, he's going to be over 20 intelligence. And we now have full control over him. Which is important not only for further success in the Metal Slime grind, but it actually becomes very important in surviving the walk to the volcano later. Because there are enemies that we're going to want Slalin to expel. <laughs> Brownie may not be smart, but he has 8 inventory slots. 12 inventory slots, not 8. I'm still thinking of DQ4. DQ4 has eight inventories left. All right, so here we uh, we're gonna throw some holy waters. Guaranteed one damage on top of the guaranteed one damage from uh, the poison needle, and get another metal slime. Two down. All right, so that's got Pierre at level nine. Um, basically, each metal slime from here is gonna be one more level. Uh, for you get one to level 10, one to level 11. Uh, another side effect of uh, this Metal Slime experience is we're also leveling up Hero a bit. The importance of that is that at level 14, Hero learns the outside spell. And that helps save a lot of money uh, once we get to the Volcano and the Waterfall Cave, if you've got it already. Uh, if you don't have it, you have to Death Warp out of those locations. But if you do have outside then A, you can save time by not having to go through a death warp, and B, you'll have more money uh, to deal with going forward. Uh, so here we're going to get a strength seed out of that pot. Uh, leather loincloth? Leather dress? Leather kilt? Out of the dresser there. And here we've got the Zenithian sword. Now, at this point in the story is when you find out that your character is not the legendary hero. Because you get the Zenithian sword and you go, yes, I'm going to equip this. And your character can't even pick it up. <laughs> so, you're not the legendary hero. And you kind of inherit your dad's quest. There, that, there's a letter right next to the sword that kind of details what your dad was doing. Tells you that about uh, his quest to find the legendary hero. And you kind of pick up on his quest right here. And set out to uh, go find the legendary hero on your own. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're just a nobody. Or are you? So here, this is a death warp. Um, once you get the Z sword and you're happy with your levels for the volcano, then just death warp out of here. It's kind of interesting, due to the way that time of day works, uh, even if you get to level 14 on the hero, it's still technically better to death warp out of here than it is to cast outside. Because if you cast outside, it's going to be nighttime, and the ship that we're about to go to isn't going to be there. Because it's only there during the day. And so, in order to cycle it reliably, you actually have to come back into town and use the inn, or walk around outside and take a whole bunch of encounters. So, death warping out is just straight up faster here. Eat the sword of the demon lord? Well, we'll kind of do that. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to equip that Zenithian sword. However, if you use it as an item in combat, it effectively uses freezing waves on the enemy and re removes any buffs or debuffs from them. Um, and that's going to come in handy on a few encounters uh, in Gen 3. And in particular on the final boss, because the final boss is going to start with bounce up. And... Uh, you want to take that down in order to drop his defense. But we'll get into that in a few hours. <laughs> we got time. <laughs>
So, since it's daytime, this ship is here, and we can take it to our next destination, which is Port Selmy. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of shopping there, and begin our journey to uh, complete our, our father's task of finding the legendary hero. And maybe mom. Maybe we'll find mom someday. Basically, the, uh, the, the intel that we've picked up uh, to this point in the game is our dad was looking for the legendary hero. He was also secretly looking for our mom because she did. She is still alive, and we are not the legendary hero. That's basically all we've got to go off of. So this shop uh, sells a magic shield, which, in addition to just being a good shield in general, is also equipable by Slalin. So that's going to come in handy later on. Um, but at this point, it's going to go on Pierre, because we just want to tank Pierre up as much as possible. So we're selling a bunch of equipment that we no longer need, and 3,400 gold is going to go into that magic shield for Pierre. Now, when I do this shop, this is also where I buy a couple of full moon herbs, uh, the uh, consumable item that removes paralysis, because there's a boss later on that has a paralysis breath that is extremely trolly. And you want to carry some of those herbs into that fight. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's it's the, the three phases of the game. Uh, childhood is called Gen 1. Gen 2 is from slavery up until a certain six and a half minute cutscene later on, and then Gen 3 is just the rest of the game from there. Alright, so that shop, a uh, little bit extra safety, you can get the Iron Helmet for Pierre. Uh, if, you've, if you've got a lot of money from encounters, you can also buy slime clothes there for small and give them just a little bit more defense. Oh yeah, it's a great cutscene. <laughs> yeah, I had to time it out because to see how long it was because okay, so these these metal slime knights aren't worth much experience. They're not like metal slimes. They're just stronger slime knights. <laughs> They're only worth 135 experience. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the I I had to time the cutscene because I take a break on that when I'm doing runs. Like I'll I'll get up, I'll go make tea. Use the restroom, talk to my wife for a bit, lay down, <laughs> and come back. So, I, I had to know exactly how much time I had there, and it, it comes out to almost exactly six and a half minutes. Alright, so here we have reached the town of Rurafin. Uh, if you are familiar with the Japanese spell names, you'll know that Rura is the return spell. And... That's... Pretty much what we're here for. We're here to learn the Rura spell, so that we can jump around the world map. It's also kind of a cool town layout, where you, you, you kind of loop around through the multiple levels of it. They definitely had fun designing this town. <laughs> here we got Bennett, who is trying to revive ancient magic that has disappeared from the world. In this case, the return spell. So he asks if uh, if we're willing to help. All right, there we're gonna pick up a magic water for Pierre and an herb from this pot. Uh, that's gonna come in handy during the volcano boss fight. Just nice little safety items. All right, this high res map is showing us where we can find the Rurafin or the Rura Moon herb, which he needs to complete his experiment here. Ah, oh, yeah, Zoom. That's what it's called now, huh? Alright, so the key thing here is that the herb can only be found at night. Fortunately, because of the way that we move in this game, it's going to be night when we get there. So that's not really a concern. Now, a lot of the enemies that you run into on this walk have the sleep hit ability. Uh, like that, 
the second enemy there, the, the demi ghoul, can put characters to sleep with his attack. So if you just go with the normal solo Pierre run away, then sometimes you end up getting sleep locked and then you never get a chance to get out of it and you just die. Um, if, if you don't have any characters capable of taking an action, you don't even get to adjust uh, who the active party is. You, you get no control over the over the fight. It's like it's really easy to just be like, yeah, just run, run, run. New encounter, run. New encounter, run. <laughs> but uh, you gotta think and make sure that you're not uh, putting yourself in a bad situation by getting Pierre sleep locked. So we pick up the herb, use a Camaro wing, get back to town. And from here on out, we're going to have the return spell, so we can finally choose where we want to go. Which, thank goodness. It's kind of interesting, because, like, I know in, like, Dragon Quest Three, Return and... Uh, and the Chimera Wings operate exactly the same. Like, both of them, you use it, you choose your destination, you go. Uh, but in this game, they operate, you know, completely different, where the wing just takes you right back to your previous town, and then the return spell gives you uh, full control. Sink. <laughs> if you uh, if you go talk to Bennett from the left here, it looks like the hero's on fire. <laughs> it's one of my favorite scenes in the game. And so here you actually get a full HP and MP restore because the game wants to make sure that you can cast Return. And he's like, "Hey, have you learned a new spell?" And you disappear. So our first trip, now that we have the return spell, is going to go back to Reinhardt, and we're going to visit Henry. The reason for this is that if you try to continue on to the next town, you'll actually get stopped in the in the upcoming cave by a guard that says, Hey, Henry's been looking for you. He wanted to invite you to his wedding. And you can't actually get past him until you go visit Henry. So we just go straight here, right off the bat. And turns out we missed the wedding, but Henry and Maria are now married. And there was much rejoicing. But once we've done our, our due diligence as a, as a good friend, come by and congratulate them, then we're going to cast Return back to Rorafin and move on with our journey. Uh, she, she left the nunnery. <laughs> After she got us into the, into the tower, she was just kind of like, I don't know, I kind of want to go marry Henry. I don't think it's explained any further than that at any point. But that's where we are. Rule number one of video game logic is don't question it. Everything works out the way it's supposed to. It's true. I mean, that, that, that tower journey... I mean, technically, their first date was her watching him get his butt kicked by the guards in slavery. And then their second date was to a tower, which is... That's, that's a solid second date. Yeah, so if you haven't gone back to talk to Henry yet, then once you come into this cave, this is where you're going to get stopped by a guard. And he won't let you proceed until you talk to Henry. Oh yeah, the barrel date. That, well, that's kind of an interesting date, because that was... I mean, that was with both of you. That's kind of an awkward... But all three of you are kind of jammed into that barrel. It's awkward for me. I mean, that's actually very fitting. Throughout this game, the hero kind of is it's just this awkward third wheel. <laughs> we don't really use him in the speedrun unless we were forced to. He's not that good. <laughs> so that's actually kind of accurate. It, that fits thematically. <laughs> And so here we're kind of really showcasing Pierre's tankiness, and he's just 
out there by himself running away from everything. There's a few encounters in there that can be problematic, uh, like the flying snake bats have a uh, paralysis ability, and uh, similar to other games, if your entire party is paralyzed, it considers them dead um, for all intents and purposes, so if you're if everybody that you have is paralyzed, it's considered a party wipe. If you have access to your wagon, it'll automatically switch them out for non-paralyzed characters. So, it is a little bit of risk there, but it's not really that bad of a cave. Alright, and here we arrive in the town of Salabona. One, one, we meet Lillian. Lillian, the dog is probably the most important character in this game, even though we're never going to see her. Okay, just kidding. This is where we meet Flora. Uh, Flora is the girl that we are going to marry in the speedrun. Um, she doesn't really get any development in this version. Like, one of the things that, like, one of the few things that I really liked about the changes to uh, the remakes was in the DS version, you actually meet Flora on the boat at the very beginning and so like she's at least exists prior to this point but in this version of the game this is her introduction <laughs> she just shows up and has a dog yeah the dog's running around outside uh Lidman's house you'll, you'll see you'll see Lillian again in a second here right there there's Lillian so we get here and we find out that the rich man in town Ludman is basically holding a competition to see who gets to marry his daughter. Uh, but what about Deb? Uh, Deb doesn't exist. I don't I don't know who that is. So, all the, the people that showed up here are just like, yeah, I want to marry the rich girl. Uh, the only one that's not really here for the money is the guy with the, the pink shirt right next to us. That's, uh, gosh, what's his name? I can't remember his name. But he's basically been in love with Flora since uh, since they were kids. And if you don't marry Flora, he actually ends up with her. But here, Ludman says, Alright, whoever goes into the volcano and retrieves the Ring of Fire for me will unlock the next part of this chain quest to marry Flora. And two of the people are just like, yeah, no, I'm out. <laughs> but, uh, but the other guy that actually likes her, uh, he's actually going to be in the volcano when we get there. So this right here is far and away the most dangerous part of the run. It's it's brutal. So this safety save, you will see every single runner do, unless they're grinding for world record and are going to reset off of anything that goes wrong anyway because we will probably be back here again. Yeah, we, we marry Flora because she starts out with better equipment than Bianca does, which we can sell for like about 3,000 gold. Um, she gets the water flying clothes given to us as a gift, which Bianca does not, and that is going to uh, help her get through the path to Chizad and then get equipped on Slalom for the end game to make him tankier. Um, the only... Oh, yeah. Speaking of the chaff, path to Chizad, uh, the, Flora also has that same mechanic that we saw with Barongo and Bianca in Gen 1, where if she dies in combat, she revives with 1 HP afterwards. Bianca doesn't do that. And this is actually the main reason that we take her uh, in, in the speedrun, is because it makes the path to Chizad way more stable. The money is great, and there are ways to work around that and, you know, change up your shopping if you didn't have that money. But just not having the path to Shazad be a major reset point is a really big deal. Alright, so we've made it to the volcano, which is fantastic, because the amount of times that you reset just walking to the volcano is very high. Those encounters are not safe. Um, but once we get in here, the encounters get much, much worse. Uh, the main thing that we don't want to see are the horse devils. You'll know them when you see them. They can cast the Blazemore spell for around 60 damage and uh, cause a lot of problems for us. Our end goal here is to have 
P. Oh, yeah, there's one of them. We want to have Pierre and then either Slalin or Hero alive when we reach the boss fight. Uh, the reason for that is Slalin or Hero are going to use spells to boost Pierre's defense, and then Pierre is going to solo uh, the boss fight. And oh my goodness, that's the encounter you don't want to see. <laughs> so you'll, you'll notice that uh, the first thing that happened when you saw three horse devils is uh, Moko reorganized the party to put just meat shields out there to try to soak blaze moors. It's okay if your dummy character dies, and then it's okay if either Slalin or Hero dies. Uh, if either Pierre dies, or both Slalin and Hero die, then you reset back to Salabona and start this walk all over again. So basically this entire walk uh, through the volcano, you're just hoping not to see horse doubles. Uh, there are some damage tiles coming up here, and it's only like one damage per step, so it's not that bad, but we still swap out to have our dummy character. This is where our hammer hood gets the most use <laughs> in the run. We, uh, we toasted his feet, and now he can retire. He's basically done until the end game. Uh, at the very oh, there's a blaze more. Oh, oh. <laughs> almost lost Pierre there. Okay, we got out. Everything's everything's fine here. <laughs> We're almost to the stairs here. Uh, just off to the right of this screen, there are stairs that go to the final room. That's that's it. Once we get to those stairs, we're, we're done. We just got to survive that walk, though. Oh, one more for the road. Alright. Alright, well, that was a very, very tame volcano, all things considered. So, a little bit of inventory reworking here to make sure that Pierre's got uh, herbs and magic waters. With his current level, it's not as big of a deal, because he's got access to the Heal More spell and quite a bit of MP. Um, but you still want to have as much healing available as possible. So the, the whole strategy here is we're going to have Pierre and Hero. Pierre is going to attack non-stop, and Hero is going to cast Upper on Pierre. And then now, this is where we set Pierre on tactics and then put the controller on auto-fire and walk away. Like you, you can take a break during this boss fight. It plays itself. So basically with the tactics that we've got Pierre set on, once he gets down around 30 HP, he's going to go ahead and heal himself. Uh, with the most MP efficient heal that he has available. So if he's missing around 50 HP, he'll cast Heal More, which is 5 MP, and that'll top off. Uh, th that'll fully heal him at that point. Um, if you come here a little bit earlier in his level and Heal More is going to be overkill, then he'll actually just use the Heal spell, which costs 3 MP. So it's more mana efficient to use Heal More. However, sometimes you get locked in this loop where all three of the Lava Savages here are using their flame attack, and he's taking about 30 HP per turn, and then just uses a regular heal spell for about 30 HP per, per turn. And sometimes it just burns through his MP like that, but uh, at this level, Pierre's got enough max HP that uh, once it gets down to that, to that point where it triggers his heal, he's going to use the heal more spell. So these uh, these lava savages have 400, yeah, 400 HP each, uh, and then they're they're either gonna attack him for one or zero damage because of his high defense, or just use that uh, use that flame attack for around 10 damage. And there you saw Pierre got down to around 20, heal more all the way back up over 100 HP. Nice Kaishin. It's kind of a, an interesting juxtaposition for this fight, where you go through the volcano, which is just the most brutal, difficult, individual segment of this run. And then the boss fight is automatic. 
like literally. You put it on tactics, set X to auto fire, and put the controller down. <laughs> and, and it turns into a break. And that's Lava Savages. So we get Hero up to level 13, so we still don't have the outside spell, which means that we're going to have to get a get out of here with a Death Warp. But more importantly, we got the Ring of Fire here. And we're going to hand the Ring of Fire over to Hero, because it needs to be in Hero's inventory to give it to Ludman. Yeah, that was that was a really good Volcano. I mean, we saw quite a few triple horse double encounters, but most of them were first try runs, so that worked out pretty well. Now for the Death Warp, once again, everybody's just going to be using the first item in their inventory. I'm just waiting to die. Now, the, the cave that we're going to after this is really weird. I say that be not because, like, its layout is weird or anything like that, but it's not a difficult location. It doesn't have a boss at the bottom of it. But for some reason, it has killed more runs for me in the past year than the volcano has. And it's one of those things that it's like when you're learning to run, it just seems like a completely free part of the run. But then sometimes it just gets in a mood. <laughs> it just obliterates you. Because there are several enemies in there that hit really, really hard. Uh, in particular, uh, Lancer enemies. It Basically in every encounter zone that Lancers can appear, it's the worst encounter to see because they deal so much damage. Like to the point where like even if you're casting uh, increase to, to boost your defense, like it's still just not enough. So. And then there are enemies in there that have sap, and then there are enemies in there that poison. And it's just, it's, it can be a nothing cave, but it can also be a run killer. Alright, so here we hand off the, the fire ring, and he's like, alright, now you can use my boat to go get the water ring. So, while we have access to this boat now, uh, we can't actually get out to the open sea, so we can't go anywhere with it except for our next destination. And here we got the water gate that's closed off. And, oh, half step away from, from getting into town on the first, without an encounter. That was close. So we're gonna come up here and we're gonna see a, a familiar face here. Yeah, so this is Duncan. That name sounds familiar. But uh, we come up to him, see if we can get the key to uh, open up the water gate and get to the waterfall cave. And while we're talking with him, he's like, wait a minute, I recognize you, you're Papas' kid. It turns out this is Bianca's dad. And we are finally, after ten years, reunited with Bianca. So, Bianca's going to join the party temporarily here. Um, it comes in handy for the speedrun because we have a few items in our inventory that we can't sell and we can't throw away. They're just they're just taking up space. And Bianca, when she leaves the party, will deposit any items that she has in her inventory into the bank. So, uh, what we generally do here is we take the Reinhardt key, the torch from Gen 1, and the raw mirror and we moved those into Bianca's inventory so that when she leaves they uh they all go away forever yep so that's what go on here it's all three so we just permanently increased our storage space by three slots <laughs> yeah it is kind of a shame we didn't get this this back in the day I love this version 
Uh, like, I know a lot of people don't think it looks very good, but I think the graphics level in this game is very... I don't know, charming, I guess. Uh, trash can. More specifically, Bianca is the trash wagon. That's that's her nickname around these parts. <laughs> Error 03 trash wagon. There you go. Yep, you just load her up with your trash and she takes it to the bank for you. Alright, so in this cave, we're taking Pierre, Hero, and Slalin. Uh, the magic shield will have been moved over to Slalin so that he's got some defense power. Uh, and then Pierre is going to be given a uh, an iron shield, and you're, you're kind of just hoping to get lucky here. Like if you get some bad luck running from early encounters and Slalin dies early, then the rest of the cave becomes really rough. Um, mostly because there are powerful enemies in here that can be gotten rid of with expel. Uh, you'll probably see expel right here. Yep, and. There are enemies that you're going to want to cast increase against before trying to run. And if Solon dies early, you just you lose so much utility that you're basically just crossing your fingers and running with your hair on fire, hoping you get to the end before everybody dies. <laughs> High Spirits has it right there. The best part of this game is you can't pick dead. You're forced to pick one of the better girls. Yeah, I've done a few runs marrying Bianca, but it's very much a meme route because it's so dangerous. Like you, you're you're short a whole bunch of money. You don't get the water flying clothes. She permanently dies during Gen Two on like on like a Flora, but it's fun to do it once in a while. Like the, you, there is a a minor advantage. It is technically faster to marry Bianca. But it's so unstable that it's not worth the time save. Uh, the reason it's faster is that after the wedding, uh, Ludman is going to send you off on a little side quest to make sure that Flora isn't going to be a hindrance to you. And you don't do that with Bianca. After the wedding with Bianca, you just you, you pick up the Zenithian shield, the gold, and you head on out. You're just done. So you, you save a couple minutes there, but... It's just so much more dangerous. So starting on this screen, you can actually start running into metal slimes in here. Um, Nothing else is really safe enough to fight for experience, but if we can get Hero up to level 14 in here, then we can skip the Death Warp at the end and instead uh, cast the outside spell. This is going to be a, a Wizard Robe, which we're going to sell for 4,500 gold, I believe. It's a lot. It's worth a lot of money. Yeah, Bianca also gets all the character development. Like, Flora just kind of appears later in the game, and it's just like, I'm rich! And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> For some people, that's enough, but, you know. My first playthrough, the, the character development that Bianca had uh, made her, made her the, the better choice. Yes, yeah, so these mermen are pretty dangerous. They can... Uh, they can sap the party, they deal a good chunk of damage, but fortunately they can also be expelled. A lot easier to deal with if Slalin is still alive here. It's kinda true. Yeah, the game very much points you toward Bianca. But that is one of the things that I appreciate about the DS version, is that since you meet Flora as a kid, it gives her, you know, something. It's like, okay, at least I know who you are, instead of just meeting you and marrying you the same day. I 
right, so we're almost to the end of this cave. This is this isn't too dangerous of an encounter. That's nice. So we're just gonna come up here. This uh, this entrance that's underneath the waterfall leads us to the water ring, and there's no boss fight in here. So we just pick up the ring, uh, and then we're gonna pop back out here, grab the chest off to the side for some gold. And then if we've managed to get Hero to 14, we'll cast the outside spell. If not, then this will be a death warp. Which in this case, Hero is level 13, so unless the next encounter is Metal Slimes, it's going to be a death warp. I guess if you just get a couple of Cure Slimes, that's not something you're going to death warp on. <laughs> it would basically let you re-roll your encounter. 1200 gold in that chest. And now we want to get out of this cave. Alright, this is a good death warp encounter. Yeah, if you marry Bianca, then Flora marries the guy that actually went to the volcano to try to get the, the fire in. If you marry Flora, then Bianca basically just lives alone for the rest of her life, and she's sad. So. Alright, so with that Death Warp, we're gonna revive Pierre, revive Slalin. We're gonna leave Brownie dead, because we don't want him leveling up. Um... You may have noticed that the level up text in this game is very slow. So we don't want anybody gaining experience that doesn't need experience. Anytime we have a character that we're not going to use, we're going to kill him off as quickly as possible. Um, Brownie is going to have one more role at the very end of the game when we have the, um, the armband of sacrifice, which is an item that when equipped, uh, if a character dies while wearing it, it'll automatically basically expel all enemies and end the fight uh, as long as it's not a boss but like random encounters it's basically just a you know get out of one encounter free card so we'll throw that on brownie after he's forcefully revived by uh, a story sequence and then if we run into an encounter that we really can't afford to run fail from then we send him out there by himself Yeah, casually, it doesn't really matter who you pick. Um, for the speed run, the difference in the amount of gold that you get, the equipment that you get, and uh, just the mechanics of Flora reviving after combat where Bianca doesn't makes a big difference for the speed run. Yeah, Flora gets some character development in party chat in the DS version, but that doesn't exist in this game. In this game, she's just a, a girl with blue hair and a white dress, and that's really all of her character development. <laughs> she's rich, she has a dog, and that's it. So, when we returned the Water Ring to Ludman, Flora realized that Bianca was with us, and was just like, Wait a minute, you guys love each other, don't you? You shouldn't marry me unless it's what you really want to do. And then Ludman is like... You know what, I like you. No matter who you choose, I'll still pay for the wedding. And here at night, we're, uh, we'll, we just go talk to Ludman. We talk to Bianca. Bianca tells us, do whatever you feel is right. Don't, don't choose me just because you feel bad. Back to the inn and make our decision. Now, fun fact. Every single person in Ludman's house has dialogue during the selection. So you can talk to the the maid that walks us up to the table. You can go upstairs and talk to Ludman's wife and tell her that you're choosing her. You can talk to Ludman. <laughs> so like that you there's there's a lot of really fun dialogue there. Man, I, I highly recommend if you ever play this casually, just talk to everybody in the house. It's it's worth a good laugh. But, since this is a speedrun, we're gonna pick Flora. Bianca wants to go help out. Yeah, I agree that the, uh, the remake music is very good, mostly. The one exception is uh, the track called Reminiscence, which I feel like they absolutely screwed up the feel of in the remakes. Like, they, like it's very... 
Like, it sounds like you're reminiscing in this version, whereas it sounds like a Disney ballroom theme in, uh, in the orchestral versions. Alright, so Lidma tells us that he commissioned a dwarf in a cave up north to create the silk veil for the wedding. So we're just going to stop by here and pick that up. Uh, this guy is also a shop. And so this is a spot where you can buy the full moon herbs for uh, the Gimma fight later, which we're doing right here. So these herbs that we're buying are going into our dummy's inventory to hold on to for one of the one of, one of the later bosses in Gen 3. Um, just because this is the most convenient place to pick them up. You're always going to have money here, and you're at the shop anyway. Grab a couple of those. Uh, the third character in that fight is going to have a staff that removes paralysis and has unlimited uses. But you want to bring those herbs specifically just in case that character gets paralyzed. So here we give the veil to Flora, which for some reason she was already wearing. Don't think too much about it. And here... Henry is a better friend than we are. He actually shows up in time for the wedding. <laughs> we missed his wedding, but he made it for ours, so... Good job, Henry. You started out as a little jerk, but you became the better person in the end. Now, this part's kind of funny, because you actually get the yes-no for the... Uh, for the marriage vows, and... You have to say yes. Like, it's it's a but thou must at your wedding, basically. But it's funny because if you say no, it refreshes so fast that if you have it on Turbo B and you're holding it down, you'll say no like eight times per second. <laughs> For some reason, that's just really funny to me given the circumstances. <laughs> like, do you want to marry her? No, 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 no. Yeah, you get that cute little kiss and go off to sleep in separate beds. It's so scandalous. Alright, so here she says, I don't want to sit here waiting for you to come home, so I'm going with you. And it gives you a yes or no option there, but you ultimately have to say yes. She's like, all right, let's go tell my dad that I'm going to go off on an adventure with deadly monsters. Surely he's not going to be concerned. And it's that little menu right there uh, is swapping Flora's uh, silver circlet for a... or for her wedding veil. Because even though she starts with the veil in her inventory, and it has more defense power than her starting hairpiece, you still have to actually change it out, which is kind of weird to me. So here you get to talk to Ludman for about five years, and he says, All right, well, I want to make sure that she's not going to be a hindrance on your journey, so why don't you guys go up to the shrine to the north and tell me what color the jar in the basement is. See, to me, the separate beds actually make sense, because, I mean, you met her yesterday, you know? <laughs> it's like, you're still getting to know each other. Are you really ready to be sharing a bed? So there, you'll see that Flora was uh, put out by herself to run away. Um, that's because Flora, if she dies, will revive it with 1 HP after combat. So you lose absolutely nothing by throwing her out on her own uh, to run away from stuff. Worst case scenario, she dies, and you're progressing the run chance percent. And that's what the main thing that really makes her more stable than Bianca in the speedrun. Because Bianca, if she dies, you actually have to go revive her. <laughs> I don't know why they decided it was important enough to differentiate them that way, but here we are. So, we check the jar. The jar is blue, which is good news. Come back here to report to Ludman. Uh, we get to loot these chests. We get the Zenithian shield. And then we're going to get some gold in the other chest. Uh, and then he says, Alright, 
I guess she's not gonna slow you down. You can take her with you. Here, have my boat. It's waiting for you in Port Selmy. So we hit return, and off we go to Port Selmy. Laura dies, you married the up instead. <laughs> there's, there's the true storyline right there. <laughs> Marry Flora for her money, kill her off, and then go pick up Bianca and be like, hey, I'm rich now, let's go. Alright, so we pick up our boat and cast return to go back to Oracle Berry. Uh, just a be closer to our destination here. And then we've got this long sea voyage here. Now, like other Dragon Quest games, the encounter rate on the ocean is very low compared to others, so you're not going to see very many encounters out here. Yeah, so in addition to reviving after combat, Flora also starts out with the Cloak of Evasion equipped, so she's got a flat percent chance. I think it's 15% to just dodge attacks in general. So, she's got decent defense, she can dodge, she can't die. It's, it's the perfect speedrunning setup, it's exactly what you want. Run from everything, you never have to stop and fight. Oh yeah, th this hero is absolutely set up for a perfectly happy life with no setbacks. Alright, so right here we've reached Ned's Inn. This is kind of going to be like a hub point almost for a lot of the game. We're going to return here a few times. Uh, it's also really convenient in that it's an inn and a church like right next to each other. So if you ever need to do a safety save and take an inn, they're, they're just a few steps apart. So it's nice and quick to do that. Um, so this mountain path is where... Flora really shines. This is the main reason that you would take Flora over Bianca, because this this is a pretty long little mini dungeon, and uh, Bianca just just dies. She <laughs> she doesn't have the cloak of evasion. She doesn't revive. You, you don't. You can kind of get through this with Pierre and Slawin and improvising increases and and such, but it, it's a lot more effort, whereas with Flora, you just run from absolutely everything. Oh, nice, got ambushed there. There you go. Oh, there's the idea. You marry both of them, and then you have four kids. Imagine how stable the endgame would be with two daughters. Alright, so off to the side, uh, on one of those paths, there is a prayer ring that you can pick up, uh, which is a reusable MP recovery item that has a chance to break every time that you use it. Uh, I used to pick it up all the time just for stability reasons, but started cutting it out after a while, just because... It's a little bit slow to go grab it, and you don't usually end up using all of your MP recovery throughout the run. Any two legendary heroes. <laughs> two equally useless legendary heroes. Alright, and so this is another one of the perks to marrying Flora, is this is the water flying clothes. So, you don't get this if you marry Bianca. So, it's gonna give Flora a little more defense here, and then when Flora leaves the party coming up, uh, the water flying clothes are going to go over to Slalom and make him decently tanky for the rest of the run. Now, this room in particular always makes me think of Victory Road in Pokemon Gen 1. It's like, it's all I can think about when I see it.
100% glitchless? Would that involve recruiting 100% of the monsters? Have fun with the metal battle. 1 in 256. Alright, well that was a very easy walk through that cave. That's exactly what you hope for every time you go in there. Alright, so we get up here and Flora passes out. I wouldn't I wouldn't think about it too much. I'm pretty sure she's just tired from learning how to be a tank. Yeah, we threw, put some armor on her, threw her out there, and was like, alright, just take a beating and stuff. That's gonna exhaust anybody, right? She can't be blamed for passing out there. Yeah, she dragged that entire wagon over the mountain. One night's rest and we're good to go. Everything's fine here. So here we're gonna pick up an item uh, called fighter hair. And what that is is a consumable version of the spell by kill. So we're gonna double a character's attack power when we use that on them. Uh, we're actually gonna purchase a ton of those later on. Uh, in, so that we can get through boss fights until we actually have the bi-kill spell, which won't be until uh, later in Gen 3. But fortunately they're not that expensive. They're only 600 gold each, so we buy a, a whole bunch of them. And then up at this shop we're just uh, we're selling Flora's Morningstar, her old Cloak of Evasion, and getting a sort of slumber for Pierre. Uh, the Sword of Slumber does have the sleep effect that it has uh, in Dragon Quest IV, but you're rarely actually going to see it because we don't fight very many non-boss encounters for the rest of this run. Uh, generally speaking, we don't fight any. <laughs> it's almost all boss experience from here on out. And they kind of fixed the whole thing with the Sword of Lethargy putting, uh, putting bosses to sleep. So we don't get to abuse that in this run, but it, the damage on it is still really good. Yeah, and here's another perk to the the water flying clothes there, is it gives resistance to them casting the Blazemore spell. So instead of taking 60 damage, she's only taking like 15. Makes the, the mini doubles there very manageable. Generally speaking, uh, this back half of the cave after the town is a lot safer. They're, the encounters aren't very threatening overall. So once you've made it this far, you're, you're basically done. You're just picking up a few items. Uh, but you don't really have to worry about party wiping here anymore. You can find metal bubbles in this cave. But it's not that useful to kill them here. Um, the best place to get a metal bubble is actually going to be at the beginning of Gen 3. Because at that point, you're going to have... Uh, like your end game party members and you're not really wasting any experience there uh, the only person that's really benefiting off of the, the metal babble at this point is Pierre uh, if Slalin is alive then it does also get you up to the point where you have the Kasap spell for the end of gen 2 which makes a couple boss fights there faster but it's not really important so while it helps to get the babble it definitely doesn't save nearly as much time as it does uh, if you get one later on so, so far here we've picked up uh, Rogue Armor, which we're going to sell, and a, our first of three World Tree Leaves. Um, you can buy more World Tree Leaves at the casino in this game, but we don't use the casino in the speedrun. So we're going to get three World Tree Leaves, and that's that's our stock for the full game. And that, that was the first of them. And then there's one more item to pick up on the way out of here. Uh, that we're going to sell. It's going to be a staff of, gosh, what staff? Staff of punishment. Here we go. It's kind of tucked away in a side room that's kind of strangely hidden <laughs> because it's in a small room that, um, that has a hidden wall on the side. Oh, no, we're skipping the staff of punishment. Okay. 
So this chest has some gold on it, and then I'm going to drop down this pit. Yeah, if you go up the stairs on the top right there, that'll take you to where the Staff of Punishment is. And basically sell that for an extra couple thousand gold. Uh, but Moko's probably happy enough with where we are gold-wise to not need it. Uh, this is a Stone of Life that basically gives one-time immunity to uh, the beat or defeat spells for one character. Whoever's holding it, if the spell would have worked, it consumes that and the character survives. So that'll come in handy in a couple of spots uh, later in the run. And with that, the, we're, we're done with this trip. We just uh, have to get through this forest and we have reached Granvania. So here it's important to make sure that any important items are off of Flora because she's going to be leaving the party here and similar to with Bianca, anything that's in her inventory is going to go uh, off to the bank. And while we can go pick them up, it's it's just slow to do that. So we move off the water flying close, give that to Slalom. Uh, we make sure that her ring is in Brownie's inventory for later. Uh, and we come up here into Sancho's house, pick up the Stone of Life, which... Uh, it's probably going to be held on to for Gen 3 to give to our daughter. And then we'll talk to Sancho to progress our story. At this point, Flora is effectively out of the party. Uh, we'll never again be able to access her inventory, which is why it was very important to uh, remove those items before talking to Sancho. So Sancho's taken us to see the king. Uh, the king is actually our uncle. We find out that our dad was the king here. Papas was the king of Granvania, uh, but he left Granvania in his brother Ojiren's uh, care while he went on his journey to find the legendary hero and his wife. Uh, and then Papas just disappeared. Like, nobody really knows what happened to him because we're the only ones that actually saw him die. So, Ojiren has just been here ruling over Granvania and he really does not want to be king. He, he never wanted to be king. He still doesn't want to be king. His daughter does not want to be a princess. So, we show up and he's just like, ah, there's the answer to my problem. You can be the king. Uh, but while we're talking to him, Flora passes out again. She's still exhausted from learning how to tank. And, oh, never mind. She's pregnant. Well, that just kind of throws a, a morality wrench into everything we kinda, we've kind of done over the last 20 minutes or so. <laughs> we've, uh, we've been using our pregnant wife as a meat shield this whole time. Whoops. That's okay. I'm sure everything will be fine. When did you have time? Uh, so it's... Time is kind of loosely defined in this game. It's about a year between the time that you escape slavery and arrive in Salabona. And it's about another year between Salabona and actually arriving in Granvania. Um, you're, you're... Like the only definitive times you're given are you're six when you start the game. You skip 10 years in slavery, so you're 16 at the start of Gen 2. Um, and then you're you're 20 right now. Uh, it's because somebody in here, somebody in Granvania mentions that your mother was kidnapped 20 years ago. So unless they're rounding, then you, you, you can assume that you're 20 at this point. So there's been four years so far in Gen 2. But, like, where they pass isn't very clearly defined at all. So here we're raiding the treasury, uh, getting a hat of happiness, which is going to go on Slalom and then later on our daughter. It's in, It gives MP regeneration as you walk around, on top of being just a very good defensive item. Uh, there's also a prayer ring in there, which is for MP recovery, and naughty underwear, which we're going to sell for, like, 4,000 gold. So, here we're going to have a long shopping sequence. We're just going to sell a whole bunch of stuff, buy a bunch of fighter hairs, get some new gear for Pierre and Hero uh, to prepare for the end of Gen 2. Uh, so, the little mini quest that we're on right now is we're going to the Cave of Trials to get the Royal Seal, basically to 
prove that we're worthy of being king. Um, while we were talking to the king, uh, the it, the chancellor in there was just like, it's like, heck no, we, we can't just let them be king. They have to go through the, the, the rites of passage and yada yada yada. And so, they're like, fine, go get the royal seal and come back. And then we robbed the castle. <laughs> yeah, we've been married for like 30 minutes, and she's already passing out from being pregnant. I, I, I think it's worth considering that she may have been pregnant when we met her. Papas is only a bit more powerful than fear. God, Papas is so good. Papas attacks twice. If we could get Papas as a playable character, we would absolutely use him in speedrun. Yeah, so here we're going to get a couple Aeolus shields. Uh which you may remember those from Dragon Quest IV. When you use it, it you it acts similar to Expel, however it uses the target's defeat resistance uh, instead of Expel resistance, so uh, it's good against some enemies, but not all. And it looks like we also get the Silver Mail there. The, the shopping here uh, varies between different runners. I like to get two Aeolus shields and um, and the iron mask here, but it looks like Moko got the the silver mail. And part of that comes from being, you know, two thousand gold shorter from not getting the the staff of punishment. So it's all different route choices. spells from Slalin here. Well, okay. Some of them are good. <laughs> Alright, all things considered, the elephants are probably the least problematic encounter here. There are uh, skull helmet enemies that can curse, and curse makes it so that you... It, it's like poison, but for your MP, so as you're walking around, your MP is draining, and that's terrible in a game that's mostly about managing your, your healing resources. And the only way to get rid of it is uh, to go to a church and pay to have it removed. Hey! <laughs> well, sometimes you find metal battles, and usually they run away. I had one run where... Um, my tactics had been shuffled by a previous encounter, and I didn't think about it when I saw the babble. I just got excited and hit fight, and so the tactics selected all my actions for me, and Pierre cast Bang, which babbles, metal babbles are immune to, so it did nothing, and then Slalin expelled it, <laughs> which on that day I learned you can expel metal babbles. They're not immune to it. <laughs> that one made me sad. It's, it's, it stuck around, and Slalom was like, nah, get out. So that chest there has the sword edge armor in it, which... Uh, we give that to Pierre. On top of it just being a very good defensive item, it also reflects back some physical damage on attackers. The... That damage doesn't come into play very much in this run. It's mostly just for its defense power and convenience. It's just sitting right there. Uh, but we're going to use it for a couple... It's just like a couple fights, and then we're going to sell it at the beginning of Jet 3. It's not like the, the Sword Edge armor at the end of Dragon Quest 3, where it's a huge part of your damage output on Zoma. Okay. Well, <laughs> Missed the button input there.
facing the relay against seven. Not quite. <laughs> that would be really interesting to see, though. Ah. Orc Kings. These aren't too bad, all things considered. Just cast increase and run away. They're not really going to do anything. That's probably going to be the last encounter uh, in this cave. Once we get the Royal Seal just up to the north here, it's actually going to disable random encounters. The reason for that is they don't want you death warping out before you fight Kandar here. So you get zero encounters between picking up that seal and fighting Kandar. After which, hopefully, Hero will hit level 14 uh, so that we can cast outside. If not, you have to make a decision between walking out and ca or death warping. So this fight's really simple. Basically, you're just using the fighter hairs to buy kill Pierre and Hero, and then Slalin's going to spam expel on the hippo until it works. Um, oh, nice Kaishin from Pierre there. So at this point, Kandar's probably just going to spam heal more for the rest of the fight because he's already taken a lot of damage. Oh, or he can get outsped and just die. Okay, well that was a nearly perfect Kandar fight. Alright, so Hero did not get to level 14, so we are walking. Oh. <laughs> Another shot at a Babel. Hopefully the uh, the Babel encounters continue into Gen 3. Like When we're getting ready to go into the Sky Tower, there's uh, an encounter zone where we can get Metal Babels. <laughs> I think every world record, like the last like five world records, has gotten a battle there. Yeah, so without the outside spell, you just gotta basically do this puzzle in reverse to, in order to spawn the front door. In fact, I just now learned you can go into that, into door number three there, instead of going all the way back to door number two. I was not aware of that. Yeah, so there's a, little, a few steps there. There's no encounters on that floor, so it's not a big deal. Yep, that's this game. In fact, we're going to be seeing that fairly soon here. Uh, we're going to drop off the royal seal, we're going to be crowned king, and then we're going to fire off into the final dungeon of Generation 2 at that point. So right here is a key story point that is pretty subtle, where the Chancellor here is just like, before he was like, no, you can't let this guy be king, it's stupid. Suddenly he's totally on board with it, and he's like, alright, I'm gonna go prepare the festivities, and then after he leaves the room, uh, the nurse comes down here and says, hey, your wife's going into labor. So, come on up here, give her a little pep talk. And then, as a good husband should do, we leave the room. Wait, no, that's not right. <laughs> You're supposed to let her break your hand, dude. I know, I've done this twice. So, the, the Chancellor has no idea that Flora has gone into labor at this point. And we're actually going to find out shortly that that's significant. So, right there, uh, when Sancho comes over to talk to us, you hear a baby crying. So I was like, ah, babies are here. Wait, yeah, babies. There's two of them. You've got twins. So you've got a son and a daughter here. Oshi? Oshi? <laughs> I'm very unimaginative with my kid names. I named the son A and the daughter Ka because it's fast. Some people like to actually name them. So now that the kids have been born, we're going to go finalize the coronation here. And the kingdom celebrates the sudden emergence of a new king, queen, prince, and princess all at once. Uh, the, the trip from Salabona to here takes about a year. 
are in order. Those are the favorite names of the King of Santine. <laughs> Princess Un. <laughs> then we do a nice little party slide across the table there, because we're a cool king. And then everybody just throws a party here. Our party is into the night, but something's wrong. So now everybody's passed out. And like the initial thought here is like everybody partied too hard and got drunk. And then, like, as you're walking, you see that kid in the shop over there, and it's like, okay, I don't think he was drinking. What happened? It turns out everybody here has actually been drugged. But I didn't vote for you. So, you get up here, Flora and the kids are gone. You look under the bed, and it turns out that the maid managed to keep the kids quiet and hide from the monsters that came and kidnapped Flora. <laughs> Bianca's revenge. There you go. We need a ROM hack where Bianca's the one that did this. Whichever, whoever you didn't marry comes and ruins everything. <laughs> Alright, so now with Flora missing, everyone's like, Oh, we need to go find the queen. So these guards are going to go off and do their own thing. We're going to go check out the Chancellor's room and find an item from DQ4, the Flying Shoes. It's like, oh, well, why are these in the Chancellor's room? He must have been using them. Which further begs the question, why are they still there if he used them? We don't answer that question, because it doesn't matter. It's a game. Video game logic is not to be questioned. So use the shoes, and they're gonna teleport us near where the Chancellor ended up going. So yeah, it turns out that the Chancellor is in league with the monsters, and when he said he was gonna go prepare the festivities, he actually went to tell these monsters, like, Hey, we, we found the mother of the legendary hero. We need to kidnap her now. And this happens. Okay. So we're, we're actually going to find him uh, up near the top of this tower, and he's not going to be in good shape. Got a new repair. <laughs> These are the backup flying shoes. You know, you're right. Those flying shoes do smell yeah. a little bit like Ragnar. Now, you don't get, get encounters here very often, <laughs> which is good because those stone men are pretty rough. Alright, so here we've reached the demon tower. Uh, so... There's three bosses at the top of this tower, and then a few key items to pick up on the way up. Um, we're gonna get our second World Tree Leaf in here. Uh, and then we're also gonna pick up the Armband of Sacrifice, which we're gonna hang on to for the end game. Alright, so this is a static encounter. Uh, there's a couple ways to deal with it. You can expel him, but it's not 100%. Um, two rounds is going to kill it. Or if you don't want to take a shot at the expel, you can, and you have an extra fighter hair, then you can have Slalin use the fighter hair on Pierre, and then Pierre will one-shot him. But either way, not really a... The, the biggest problem that that encounter creates is if he drops the iron claw and you don't notice it because then it throws off your inventory management because one of the key things throughout this run with uh the limited inventory space is inventory management like you spend the entire game routing when to pick up items what order where everything is all of that so if you get that claw there, it actually throws things off here because uh, the strength seed in one of those chests ends up going to the wrong person, and then the robe in the other chest isn't where you expect it to be. It seems like a small thing, but when you're when you're doing a, a route that's completely muscle memory for inventory management, then it could throw you off sometimes. So that's the armband of sacrifice. 
Uh, we're going to hold on to that until the very end of the game. Just the tower from DQ4? Uh, no, this one is actually a separate tower. Um, we will later see Zenithian Tower from Dragon Quest IV, and they actually did a really good job of recreating it. Um, it's... I don't know exactly how many years have passed between 4 and 5, but uh, the Zenithian Tower is very much in ruins, but the layout is still basically the same, just with a few changes from things like crumbling and such. But it's really cool to see it uh, in back-to-back. See, I learned how to run 5 before I learned uh, 4. So when I got to Zenithian Tower in 4, I was just like, oh, hey, I already know how to get through here. <laughs> There's a couple of differences. There's a few more rooms in 4, but... The uh, the overall layout's the same, so it didn't take me very long to learn that part of the speedrun. Alright, so here, on the sides here, you see those Bowser heads? They... that, that fire breath will deal about 50% of everybody's HP. So if you get hit by two of them, everybody's dead. So the, there's a, a boulder in there to kind of show you that the rocks can block the fire, and that's going to be important shortly. So this one, the lower boulder, is actually this bomb crag, and that's an intentional encounter to reset the encounter threat because you, it's 100% susceptible to expel. So you're going to get into the fight, you're going to immediately expel it and move on. Um, but the idea there is to minimize the chances of getting actual random encounters on this floor, because there are some very dangerous encounters here. Uh, in particular, the ones with the arm lions that you really, really don't want to see. So the chest that we got there was uh, the World Tree Leaf, so we now have two. The third one, um, some people skip the third one. It's a little bit off to the side in Zenithian Tower. Yeah, I know. But uh, we'll see what Moko does with that. <laughs> Bomb crags. I th think they can, um, but in the speedrun, Hero's level never gets high enough to recruit anything past like the early Gen 2 monsters. Like the brown golems uh, that you can see later on have a 25% recruit chance, but Hero has to be level 17, for example. Yeah, so here... <laughs> We need to get this rock down below, and if you walk into it from the side, it's a 50% chance for it to go up or down. So you basically just have to keep pushing it until it goes down. Yeah, a lot of monsters can join you in this game. Um, and they, they added more in the remakes. So I think the, I think the DS version has 30 more monsters that can join. Something like that. It's re it's a really interesting part of playing it casually, and it adds a ton of replay value because you can just you can change up your party so much. I love that part of it. Yeah, so this is a, uh, a forced encounter, so we can't run from it. So we're just using the Aeolus Shield and the Expel spell uh, to try to force all of these out of the encounter. And Pierre, and a lot of things change. Everything changes. <laughs> Pierreless DQ Fives is a completely different game, and it's not easy. All right, so hitting these switches is going to uh, lower a couple drawbridges outside and give us access to the top of the tower. Oh, there's the arm lions. <laughs> <laughs> Getting really low on MP. There's been a lot of healing going out here. Yeah. I think we still have a couple of magic waters from earlier that might get used, depending on if we get any more encounters. Uh, Hero's going to have a forced MP recovery during the third of these bosses. There's the Chancellor, by the way. After betraying us, the monsters betrayed him and left him to bleed out. Looks like we're moving the magic water. Yep. Get a little bit more MP on here. On here. 15, that's a max roll on that. That's pretty good. Alright, so this uh, orc... Orc level 20. 
fourth level 20? Uh, he's got 950 HP, uh, and he is on a set cycle. He's gonna just attack for the first few turns, but then he's gonna use uh, Rukunon, the Kasap spell. So Hero's actually gonna use the Zenithian shield before he casts his sap, so that it'll reflect it back at him. And that's gonna give us more attack power. Nice Kaishin there. So it's basically just, you know, standard tactics that you're gonna see for most of these fights. You know, Fighter Hero, here and Hero, Slalom, help boost defense, and then just beat him down. So one important thing to note with uh, the Zenithian shield is uh, it, it grants the bounce effect, so that spells will be reflected back at the caster. So if you put it... If you use the Zenithian shield on Hero, Pierre will not be able to heal the hero. However, the hero can still uh, heal himself through the effect. Hello. Here we got Wyvern level 35. 800 HP here. Uh, a little bit more dangerous. Uh, it's got Hyaturuko here, the Snowstorm. Uh, Snowstorm can be bounced back after the Z shield goes up here. Uh, but it's also got this... Uh, well, there's got Firebane. And it also has a Breath Attack that can still hit through the Z-Shield. Plus physical attacks, obviously. Nice Kaishin. Getting lots of lucky crits on this one. So we're bouncing a little bit of magic damage back using the Z-Shield here. Um, and you'll note that we're not putting any effort into healing the hero right here. There's a point in the next fight where... Well, okay. Not a point. <laughs> the next fight can't really start until Hero ends the turn below 50% HP. 50 HP. And that includes being dead. Because um, Jami is going to have a barrier that basically makes him unbeatable. However, once Hero's HP gets down under 50%, then at the end of the turn, uh, Flora's going to jump in and radiate magical energy which is going to dispel the shield and it's going to fully heal the hero and restore his mp so um and then and then the fight's really going to start so on the first turn you're probably just going to see uh hero cast upper on pierre and then pierre and Solon are going to defend most likely but since hero is already at low hp then at the end of turn one it's going to go straight into removing the barrier So here we're back to use the Z shield, use the fighter hairs, punch the boss. This boss is actually kind of kind of interesting because most enemies in Dragon Quest won't target people with the bounce effect with single target spells. Jami will. <laughs> so if he casts Blazemore on Hero, it's going to bounce back and just help us deal damage, which is fantastic. Alright, and here, uh, if Solon dies, it's not the end of the world. He doesn't necessarily need this experience. Uh, the experience routing throughout this game gets him to where he needs to be just off of uh, all of the other fights not counting this one. So if he dies here and misses the experience, it's it's not too bad. This is a little bit of time to revive him later on. But with that, Jami is killed. Slalon reaches level 15. He's going to learn Kasap, Rukanon. And with his dying breath, Jami turns Hero and Flora to stone. Feels stoned hero man. And this is the infamous Gen 3 cutscene. Uh, this is six and a half minutes, so typically runners will take a break right here. This is where I get up, I go make tea, I go lay down. Uh, and there's a couple times I went for a walk. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice built-in break. Back here, everyone's like, we can't find the king or the queen now. And everyone 
spends the next eight years trying to find us. Yeah, we get a, we get an eight year bio break. Uh, it doesn't auto run, but pretty much anybody speed running this game is going to have a, a turbo controller. So you just set it on auto fire and walk away. So here they're auctioning off the hero. <laughs> you get bought for 2,000 gold. What a deal. And then they actually don't sell Flora. He's just like, ah, I've got plans for this one. Do with that information what you will. It's not really specified <laughs> what it is that he's doing with her. But she's going to end up showing up again much later in the run. <laughs> God will continue requesting for Glory 13. Yep. See you guys in eight years when we can continue this run. That's it. It's a it's a hat rack. Oh yeah, DQ11 uses a ton of music from from five. Like I, most of my time playing DQ11 was going. Oh hey, this is from DQ5. So here, the man that bought us brings us home as a a good luck lawn ornament, and we get to watch his son, Gigo Gijo. I don't know how you pronounce it. G I G O. We get to watch him grow up. Kind of a really interesting way to show time passing here. See him taking his first steps. He's gonna be running around the yard. Georgie Porgy. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, DQ5's music is very, very good and rightfully reused many times. And then we watch Gijo Gigo get abducted by monsters. Bye. So the uh, basically what's going on is the monsters are going out and uh, kidnapping any young kids because they're still trying to make sure that the legendary hero doesn't. Uh, doesn't get to grow up. Kind of like what's going on at the beginning of Dragon Quest IV. There's just a whole bunch of child abductions going on worldwide at this point. Just to be thorough. Fortunately, Uncle Sancho has been keeping our children safe. Frustration kind of boils over here and we get kicked over. Yeah, this scene always makes me want to play Harvest Moon. <laughs> like, just sitting here, the house with the fence around it, watching the seasons change. And I was just like, man, I want to play Harvest Moon. And the years passed. DQ5 hero statue cameo. <laughs> I need a ROM hack. Yeah, this hero just can't catch a break in his life. I mean, from a small ch you know, from the moment of his birth, his mother is abducted, spends his life on the road, searching never get a chance to settle down finally gets a chance to settle down in Reinhardt only for his dad to be killed in front of him and get sold into slavery it's been 10 years in slavery and then escape finally meets a wonderful woman and marries her only to have her taken away and then he gets petrified for 8 years
You know, sometimes you just get stoned for eight years. What can you do? But here, Sancho and the kids show up at long last. They are now eight years old. Uh, our daughter here has the Staff of Storos, which she uses to remove the petrification. Our son tells us, hey, remember that sword that you left behind? I can use that. And it's like, oh, hey, our son here is the legendary hero. We were never going to find that. <laughs> now, since we finally found the legendary hero, we can finally, you know, build up our ultimate party in this game. That does not include him. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, I'm the legendary hero. It's like, great. Please go sit in the wagon. Oh, and please don't be alive because I don't want you getting experience. The legendary backup character. I played around with a route uh, to actually use him, and it was not good. There's just no way to make it good. Oh yeah, he's useful in PS2. Um, I think the PS2 route actually uses him. I'm not overly familiar with it. I, re I only really know this version. Um, I don't really know a whole lot about PS2 or DS versions. And he he's also used in DS? Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, not very useful in this version. So we're going to kill him off at the earliest uh, convenience and stuff him in the wagon. So up there we talk to Sancho. Uh, unlike our son, Sancho is actually extremely useful. He joins us at level 20, which is far ahead of where anybody else is. Because we haven't exactly been taking encounters. And then Sancho's going to be a very tanky character for the rest of the run. Uh, we stopped by the, the friend bank there to pick Sancho up. So you, first you talk to him up in the throne room, he goes to the tavern, and then you go to the tavern and you actually add him to the party. Um, I'm going to head back to Reinhardt here. It, this is just a quick stop off to get a piece of armor for Sancho. Uh, it's a piece of cursed armor that has very high defense, but reduces the wearer's agility to zero. And that's actually really good for us on a couple of fronts. Um, one, most notably, is that we want Sancho going last whenever possible because he's going to have the Sage Stone at the end of the game. And so we want him healing people up at the end of every single round after all of the attacks have gone out. Um, there's another interesting effect from that where it, you can kind of break the game's turn order calculation to make Sancho go first whenever you want when he has zero agility. Um, the simplest way to explain that is corpses in your party inherit the agility stat of the character in slot one. So if Sancho's in the front of your party with zero agility, any corpses that are in your active party will also have zero agility. And when the game is doing its turn order calculations, it starts with your first character and compares it to your second character, and then the third, and then the first enemy, second enemy, so on and so forth. And, you know, goes through all of its calculations like that to determine turn order. However, if there's a tie, the calculation stops and it says that character goes right here. So, if you have Sancho with zero agility and a corpse with zero agility, it's going to compare Sancho to the corpse, there will be a tie, and it won't compare Sancho to anybody else, Sancho will go first. So you can kind of abuse that to make sure that like, if you really desperately need a heal, you can have him go first uh, at the beginning of a round 100% of the time. And you can occasionally run into that uh, just randomly throughout the, uh, throughout the game. However, it's very unlikely because um, the, the it takes your agility, multiplies it by a random number, and then does the turn order calculation from there. So it's possible to have a tie, but you don't see it very often. So, yeah, that's the, that's the Cliff Notes version of how that, of how that works. <laughs> 
sometimes you'll see that uh, taken advantage of during the last couple of fights to make sure that uh, so that we can manipulate turn order. So we get that armor, we keep it, keep it on Sancho, and uh, we're going to head off to Elhaven now, which is actually the town that our mother came from. Which is where we actually find out that uh, we're basically, we're half elf, and then we also find out that whichever, uh, whichever woman you marry, either Bianca or Flora, I don't know if it's both of them or just the one that you choose. Uh, it turns out to have Zenithian ancestry. I'm, I'm really not sure exactly how that works, but either way, your wife has Zenithian ancestry and you have elf ancestry. And you put those together and you get a legendary hero. And that's basically <laughs> how all of this works out. Yeah, Pierre does cheat. He's actually two characters. Dwarf Ancestry? Uh, not this game, unfortunately. And so here our son is still alive. Hasn't died off yet. So that's why right now the the running party is Sancho's son. Just waiting for him to die. It, it's not too urgent. You just need to make sure that he's dead before we gain experience. Because any time that he spends leveling up is going to be wasted. But we're also not going to fight anything for quite some time. Yeah, if, you, if you like fighting random encounters, this is definitely not the run for you. Once we get into Gen 2, it's just like, okay, I've recruited Pierre, I got my Metal Slimes, I don't want to fight anything anymore. <laughs> just run away from everything and push through the game with boss experience only. Alright, so we finally got... The legendary hero killed. Which is a good thing. We can't marry Bella. She's a fairy. Elf and fairy probably does not make a legendary hero. No fling. Oh man, a no run percent of this game would take forever. Alright, so here, um, there are random encounters that can cast Beat, and that's uh, what we've been holding on to those Life Stones for. So we actually have Sancho with the Life Stone right now, just in case you get one of those encounters. And we reached the town of Elhaven. Now, this town has two really good shops in it if you're playing casually. You can get some really good armor, like magic armor and such. Uh, and then you can also get some really good weapons. But we're not here for any of that. We just want a magic carpet and a magic key, which are both just sitting in this town, conveniently. So you come down, uh, down these stairs, we get the magic carpet, which is our next mode of transportation. And then cast return to get back to the entrance, and then go left and get the magic key. And you notice that step running, like, Moko took a few extra steps prior to the first town entrance. Uh, and that was actually to progress the day-night cycle so that it's daytime right now. Because uh, we're about to go back to Granvania, and we want to go into the vault, which is not accessible at night. So this was actually a very intentional step routing to make sure that it's daytime here. It's not too bad if it's not, it's just you just take a few steps outside here, but... It's still intentional. <laughs> Yeah, because at night, this guard is actually blocking that doorway. But now that we have the magic key, we can open the red doors. And in the treasury, we're going to get 3,000 gold and the wonderful meteorite armband, which is an accessory that doubles the wearer's agility. And that's going to get passed around uh, from character to character for different situations th for the rest of the run. like Ultima 7 magic carpet that would require me to know what the Ultima 7 magic carpet was uh, basically it's it's like the hovercraft from Final Fantasy 4 where it can get you over water and stuff but it's it, you can't go past trees or anything like that 
So you can go over land, you can go over water. That, that's about it. So it gives us access to more locations, but it's not unlimited access. So we're going to have another extended shop sequence here where we restock on fighter hairs and then pick up a little bit more armor. This is also where you would revive Slalin if he died on uh, on the Jami fight. But Slalin survived, so we don't have to go up there. And this is another point where there's a lot of runner preference. Like, I've seen some runners buy a ton of extra fighter hairs here. I buy just enough to get through uh, the next few boss fights with one extra for, you know, just in case. But I've seen runners buy, like, up to six extra fighter hairs here so, uh, just for taking fights in the Dragon Tower. And the funny thing is, they're fights that I take as well. I just don't use the fighter hair on them. It's another example of just where there's so much runner preference in this game. There's a lot of variety in how people play this game, and all of them are good. <laughs> well, most of them are good, obviously. There is such thing as a bad decision, but you can make pretty much anything work in this run. It's similar to DQ7's carpet. No, I don't know about DQ7's carpet either. 7 is a run that I'm very unfamiliar with. <laughs> I, I've been conscious for portions of the Countess's DQ7 runs, but I've never seen a full one. I know there's a flying rock. Alright, so here's our first return trip to Ned's Inn, and we get to use the magic carpet to uh, head on up to Zenithian Tower. So we can go over the water, we can go over the swampland here, but these mountains and trees we cannot go past. Now out here you can actually find metal babbles. And this is where you really want to find one, because that gets Sancho, the daughter, and Pierre experience. And that's a big deal. So let's see if Mocha's gonna go for the... Yep, okay. So we are taking this side trip here uh, to get the third world tree leaf. It's not too dangerous. Um, this is, generally speaking, usually a safe area. But you've got really good defense. You've got Pierre and Hero loaded up with MP for healing spells. So you're not usually gonna, gonna party wipe in here. But occasionally, you know, things can go wrong with ambushes and run fails. Now, th yeah, these golems have a 25% recruit chance, but Hero has to be level 17, and uh, Hero is currently level 13, so we can't actually recruit them. Oh, Hero's 14, never mind. I missed that level. So, Hero being 14 is important, because now we have the outside spell. Let's just get right back here. Play the remakes or the originals. That really depends on personal taste. I am very much a 16-bit junkie, so I will play the Super Famicom versions wherever they're available. So 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. Um, I'm really, really sad that we didn't get a, a Super Famicom uh, remake of Dragon Warrior 4. But the NES and Famicom versions are still very, very good, so I can't complain too much. But I, I feel like SFC4 would have been my favorite in the series by far if we ever got it. Yeah, so once again, you're just going to see a whole bunch of running away. There's a few encounters where, um, like, if you had brought Slalin in here, you could expel. I think you can use the, yeah, you can use the Aeolus shield on uh, the Jami reskins. We lost hero there. That's not that's not too big of a deal. It just means that we're short some healing, but he's pretty squishy anyway. Sancho and Pierre are really the, the powerhouse of the current group. Yeah, but it's on PlayStation hack. <laughs> I don't have a PlayStation. 
plus the, plus then you've got the like the camera rotating and stuff that you, you don't get just get that static camera point so that chest that we walk past is a tiny metal uh, in case you're one of those people that watches speedruns and constantly wonders it's like what is the item that they didn't pick up just now basically everything that we see but don't grab in this run is a tiny metal or a mimic almost without exception Have you heard of them? I don't know. Are, are you giving it away, Countess? I just bought a... I just bought a PS4, so... <laughs> we we can discuss that later. <laughs> yeah, so if you're, if you're familiar with, with Dragon Quest IV Zenithian Tower, you'll notice that the layout here has been very consistent with the original tower, so it's... It's kind of a fun Easter egg slash... Easter egg, Easter egg slash dungeon. Solid callback. And if we can get out of this encounter, which is just <laughs> these guys just casting iron eyes over and over again, then we'll get up to this chest next to this Zenithian, and this is going to be the magma staff, which we also saw in Dragon Quest IV, and we're going to use it for the same thing. So Hero, since Hero was dead, we had to first pass the flying shoes over to Sancho. And now we're done with the flying shoes. Yeah, pop in there and revive. So we're, we're almost done with the flying shoes, because now we're going to use them one more time to get back there. and do a quick MP refresh at the end here. And then we're going to hit uh, Taraco Mine, which is the final leg of the journey prior to reaching Zenithia. And if you like minecart dungeons, then boy oh boy. Do I have a surprise for you? Oh, this is interesting. I haven't actually seen this approach. So typically what you see is you use the flying shoes to get out of Zenithian Tower, uh, and that pops you out near Granvania, and you just fly east and then north, but going back to Oracle Berry in order to revive Hero, you know, puts you in position to just fly southeast instead. <laughs> There's a good encounter. Preemptive attack, you get to run right away. 100% chance to run if you get a preemptive. Alright, so in here, the enemies are extremely dangerous. There's a ton of physical damage. Um, these great mamus that we're fighting, the pink dudes, uh, they are very susceptible to expel, but not 100%. Um, there's also zombie warriors, which are, I believe, 100% on expel, if not very close. Um, you've got the bull pig things. Yeah, these guys. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what they're called, but uh, they they can tank up, they can hit really hard. So, you usually just aeol the shield and cast increase to not die. And then there's these purple devil looking dudes. Man, these, these things are just showing up on cue every time I start talking about them. So these guys aren't very dangerous whatsoever. Like, you just increase to get your defense up and then run away. They're not going to do anything. But the thing you really don't want to see in here... Alright, well, let's test... Let's test my, my commentator magic here. The thing you really don't want to see in here are the spikerous enemies. Okay, good. It didn't happen. Uh, those things have a kamikaze attack that... It doesn't matter how much you buff your defense up, they're probably going to kill whoever they hit. Oh, yeah. They look like... Yeah, they look like that. That's what we don't want to see. Yes, the Metal Kings in this game do have chance. 
So, you will not see Moko attacking a Metal King. If you see a Metal King, it's just run away. But we're not going to have a chance to see those until uh, Evil Mountain. Like, the very end of Evil Mountain. Maybe there's one room where you can run into Metal King. So. Yeah, so this whole dungeon is basically just flip certain switches to adjust the tracks and go for a ride. So one interesting thing is that you can't get encounters while you're on the mine tracks. However, your encounter progression still goes. So it acts like you're taking steps while you're riding the cart. And then once you get off, you're probably going to get into an encounter if it's, a, if it's one of the longer ones. <laughs> yep. Yep, that's exactly why we don't fight the Metal Kings. <laughs> sometimes they just wipe your party, sometimes they drain all your MP. Not good. Yeah, Evil Mountain's the, absolutely the best name for Villain Stronghold. I think the best thing about Evil Mountain is that it's a return point. So even if you have to leave the final dungeon and come back, you don't have to walk there, you just warp straight there. Yeah, so you get a tiny little speed boost from... Oh, there's a spiker. Uh, you get a tiny speed boost from entering and exiting the minecarts, which is why you see Moko doing that occasionally. Oh, I like this part. It's like a water park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Poussin. They turned him into Flanders in the remake. I re I very clearly remember that. And I very much hated it. I don't like what they did with a lot of the dialogue in the DS versions. Alright, so this is the Staff of Benevolence. It's going to cast the Heal More spell when used in combat and has unlimited uses. So that's going to be our primary source of healing for the rest of the run. Dr. Aegon. Who could have known that Dr. Agon is a dragon? I feel like I groaned when I read most things on the DS version. <laughs> no, he talks like Ned Flanders from The Simpsons in, in the DS version. So here's another one of those skulls that can, uh, that can curse. What's funny is when they curse Slalom, because Slalom has the Hat of Happiness on, which actually regenerates MP faster than the curse depletes your MP. Which kind of turns the minecart sequence into a seizure warning, because you're constantly flashing red. And unlike other characters, which once they run out of MP, the curse stops doing anything and the screen stops flashing, Slalom's unlimited MP just keeps it going. Alright, so now we have arrived at Zenithia, which is underwater. I don't know exactly what the explanation is for how we're walking around here. There's like a magical bubble or something that's keeping the water out of most of it, but not all of it. But either way, we do the most Dragon Quest thing ever and find a secret staircase behind the throne. And this is where we're going to find out that uh, the Zenithian castle was kept afloat by two golden orbs, which sounds kind of familiar. Where have we seen a golden orb before? We'll have to think about that. So he's gonna channel the magic of the orb to track down what happened to it, and we're gonna get a, a fun little flashback scene here where you get my favorite track of the game. Yeah. 
Yes, orb. So after the lightning strike in this cinematic is where uh, the the reminiscence track kicks in. And I absolutely love it. Dude, orbs are what make RPGs work. They're all powered by orbs. <laughs> Parable! Well, this place looks familiar. So it turns out that golden orb that we found back at the beginning of the game after defeating the boss ghost with Bianca was actually the orb that fell out of Zenithian Castle. Now what happened to that orb again? Hmm. So this is actually a little scene that we skip in the speedrun, but um, when you're doing the part where you can go to the Fairy Kingdom, you can actually go near the church and talk to your future self. <laughs> And he just kind of, he looks at the orb and then hands it back to you, or so it seems. Oh yeah, that's right, Gemma destroyed the orb. Well, guess the castle ain't flying anymore. Now Pisana's like, oh no, the orb was destroyed. Well, hopefully the, the fairies can create a new orb. You should go talk to them. We're gonna head to the fairy forest here and see what we can do about getting a replacement orb. Sub so Sancho Pierre, daughter. So going into this castle, or this castle, going into this forest, you need uh, one of the kids involved because if you recall back at the beginning of the game. Um, the hero was the only character that was able to see Bella, because only kids can see fairies. So, if you go through this forest without one of the kids in the party, you actually can't see the fairy at the end, and you have to leave and come back. So, those, those ogre heads are actually the best encounter to get in here. They're strictly support characters that do nothing on their own, so they're, they're just going to be casting a whole bunch of buffs on themselves and then never actually dealing damage. Another really good encounter here is the jewel bags, because they're not dangerous. The best encounter in here um, is, I think it's eight, it's seven or eight metal slimes, which I never get to find, but my good friend Hactical had multiple runs where he found groups of metal slimes in here. It's just like, come on, man, let me have those. Yeah, so here there's an invisible fairy. You, you talk to it, it freaks out and runs away. And then your daughter's like, what, you guys can't see them? Here, I'll show you where they went. And so this this part right here is being auto-controlled. With the daughter leading the way following the fairy. And wow, this place looks familiar, but it was a lot colder last time we were here. At long last, we've returned to the fairy kingdom. Turns out, it's like, hey, she said she owed us a favor like 18 years ago. Wonderful. Let's, uh, let's cash in on that. And she's like, okay, well, I can't do anything about the orb, but here, take this fairy horn. Go to the hidden fairy castle on a lake surrounded by mountains and blow the horn at the center of the lake. I'm like, okay, more breadcrumbs. That one looks like she's wearing bunny ears. She really does. Yeah, so now we can see the fairy. And after talking to her, um, all random encounters cease until we get a screen transition. Uh, not, not that kind of screen transition, but like actually entering or exiting an area. So we come here and pick up the fairy sword. Uh, that's going to stay on the daughter for most of the run, though it's going to get passed for use purposes later on for a couple of fights. Um, 
the fairy sword, while dealing decent damage, more is more important for the fact that when you use it as an item in combat, it casts upper on the user. So we're going to have the do our daughter using that at the beginning of a lot of encounters, just so that she has defense power. Uh, she's going to have some good agility, and she's going to have the meteorite on band for most of the run, so she'll almost always go first. So it'll be interesting to see if Moko tries to go for a metal babble here. I've seen some runners like try to force encounters just to see if you can get a couple shots at a metal battle, but no, okay. <laughs> I always forget about this screen. Like, I get to this screen at like 8 o'clock at night whenever I do these runs, because it's like, it's about four hours into the run and I usually start at four. And so it's like, it's usually dark, my eyes have been adjusting, and then you get to this screen and it just absolutely blinds me. <laughs> Well, we blow the horn that we got from Palin, and the fairy castle comes into view. Which, to me, looks like a sad face crying rainbows. I can't unsee it. Let's see if you guys can see it. Because the gate is the mouth, the two windows are eyes, and then the banners are just, like, rainbow tears. <laughs> Yeah, so here the uh, the Elf Queen gives us the uh, a golden orb. However, she tells us that she no longer has the power to enchant it with the ability to make the castle fly. So right now we've just got a useless golden orb. Yeah, come over here and raid the treasury real quick. Uh, in here we've got the Staff of Thunder, which in this game sells for 15,000 gold. Huzzah. And then also the princess robe, which our daughter is going to be wearing for the rest of the game. Oh yeah, you'll never unsee it. <laughs> There's a few faces like that. Uh, like at the very beginning in the ship, uh, the transition screen from when you go upstairs from where Papa's is looks like a face too. And so we talk to that fairy and they tell us that if you go check out this picture, it will take us to wherever our heart most desires to be. And our heart most desires to steal from ourselves in the past. So, we go back to childhood Santa Rosa. Yeah, <laughs> rain-based faces. It's pareidolia at its best. Yeah, so we come up here and uh, talk to the guard near the cave, and that will spawn our child self out in front of the church. And then it's very important when you talk to yourself to say yes. Always say yes to yourself. If you say no, then he actually leaves and despawns, and you have to go through that transition to leave, and then go through the transition again to come back. But basically, she's like, oh, hey, let me see that cool orb you have there. And then you swap that orb for the fake one. So it actually turns out that Gemma destroys the fake orb, and we now have the real orb. <laughs> no, our heart does not desire to save Dad. Our heart desires to steal from a child. And as with all time travel things in games and movies, it's best not to think too much about it because now we're just going to ignore the existence of this painting. Forever. We're never going to use it for anything else again. Even though it is just the most useful tool available. Imagine what we could do if our desires changed. It's like, okay, well now I really want to go to the end credits. <laughs> I 
All right, and since we went to Santa Rosa in the past, it unlocks as a return point now, so we can actually go straight there. And we're gonna go there uh, to hit the weapon shop, and we're gonna buy the Spear of Zeus for Sancho and the Dragon Killer Sword for Pierre. It's gonna cost a total of 28,500 gold, but good news. That Thunder Staff that we looted is 15,000. The Robe of Serenity that we picked up in the Demon Tower is 4,500. And then there's usually, you know, some various items that we're gonna be holding on to from earlier on, like the Sun's Morning Star Steel Armor. Potentially holding on to other things from earlier. But not as hard as it sounds to get to that 28,500 gold. Yeah, that transition in the painting is, like, just the ultimate bitrate killer. <laughs> like, you go in there and your stream just, like, collapses. Alright, so now that we've got, uh, got our shopping trip out of the way, we've got our golden orb, it's time to revisit Zenithian Castle, give the orb to Passan, and unlock our new flying mount because now we actually get to travel around using the castle which is actually really cool because it can go over mountains um it just has to land on open ground and it is a return point so you know casually playing this you can take this wherever you want to have a convenient return point land it there and just you know jump back there whenever you need to in our case, we're just going to take it to the next dungeon, which requires it to access. I like the water effects when it's rising up, too. It's pretty cool how it phases into less water over time. <laughs> Why would you patch up the hole? Just, just, just tie down the orb. You don't need to patch up the hole. Okay, so now we just get to enjoy the scenery. You do actually have control of this. Um, it will only move in the four cardinal directions, and once you start in the direction, it'll keep going. Like you can't actually stop until you land. So. We're just going to go over until we're just past uh, Bianca's town here, and straight down. And this is going to take us to a very convenient landing spot right outside the uh, the Dragon Tower, which is where we're going to live for a little bit. Um, there's two bosses in there. Because the Of the three enemies that were involved in Pappas' death at the beginning of the game, there's Jami, Gons, and Gemma. Uh, we've already killed Jami at the end of Gen 2, but in this tower, we're gonna take out Gons and Gemma, so our revenge for our father's death will be complete at that point. But there's a couple of things to pick up here first. Uh, just like in Dragon Quest 4, we can go over into this side room and pick up a uh, World Dew. It's a single-use item that will fully heal all party members, including those in the wagon. And then we pop up through what looks like a fireplace and check this dresser for the grappling hook. Which is kind of a weird item, but hey. <laughs> it comes in handy in this one dungeon that we're about to go to. A little bit of inventory management here. We want to make sure that our daughter has the fairy sword, the princess robe, hat of happiness, meteorite armband. Uh, she's going to have the Zenithian shield. She's going to have the staff of benevolence. And let's see what you take in here. Okay. So there's multiple trips into this tower. The first one, we have to go in through the top because the front door is locked. Uh, and so we're going to go in with Sancho Pierre Hero because this gives us maximum healing ability and uh, a bit of tankiness because we still haven't actually taken a fight with Daughter in the party. So she's currently level 5 and very, very squishy. 
So sometimes I'll take her in uh, through the top here and hope that I get an encounter that I can fight just to give her a head start on experience for the tower, but it's definitely safer to go Sancho Pierre Hero here. So pretty much everything here is just going to be your typical spam run, hope for the best. <laughs> and her, our only goal at this point is to get back down to the, the ground floor and unlock the front door. Uh, at that point, we're actually going to leave the tower to reorder the party, and then we're going to go Sancho, Pierre, and Daughter uh, in order to make our second trip into the tower uh, to go into the basement. So the reason why our daughter is so important is when she gets to level 16, she's going to learn by kill. And fortunately, this is not a 50% chance like it is in DQ3. She is guaranteed to learn it. So um, we, we definitely want that for later because we can't really just keep restocking fighter hairs. We <laughs> There's a lot of fighter hairs needed to, to do the end game if you were going to go that route. But with the, the Princess Robe and the Hat of Happiness, she's actually got decent defense. And since she can use the Fairy Sword, you know, she can cast Upper on herself, get even more defense. She's got good agility, and with the Meteorite Armband, is almost always going to go first. So she can use that with the Staff of Benevolence to cast Heal more on, you know, at the beginning of every round. Just overall a very, very good character to have. Unlike our useless son who is nothing without his Zenithian armor. If you're nothing without the suit, you don't deserve to wear it. A wise man once said. So one of the few encounters in here that we will be happy to see is going to be uh, three black dragons. Um, huh. Well, in this case, you get two metal drags and a black dragon. The Metal Drax are very, very dangerous. They they deal a lot of damage, um, but they do actually take bonus damage from Pierre's Dragon Killer, because they are classified as dragons. So they're... Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, well, sometimes Sancho just gets nuked. Um, so... Probably just gonna run and hope for the best at this point. No? Go, okay, using the world leaf. Alright, so that's one world leaf down. We got two left. But that also wipes out the increases on Sancho, so he's a little bit squishy right now. We're using that high agility with the meteorite armband to heal up daughter. Okay, no, this is fine now. We're good. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Yeah, so with the dragon killer and the fighter hair, uh, Pierre can one-shot everything in here. Well, the dragon's in here, which... Yeah, so that's gonna give us a little experience on daughter, get her a little more health, a little more defense. This is a very, very dangerous dungeon. I mean, it's very easy for, you know, your party to wipe in here. There's so many extremely dangerous random encounters. Uh, the first boss in here isn't very bad at all. He's just a single target attacker that takes one action per turn, so it's a situation where you buff up and you just beat him down and heal whoever he hit on each turn. So if you're looking for experience, that triple dragon fight is actually good. Uh, you're usually going to come out of that fight with everybody at full, full or near full HP. Um, but... Moko's apparently happy with experience at this point. And so here we're going to fight Gons. So this is the other enemy that was present at our father's death. Uh, he's got 1700 HP and just attacks. That's all he does. He's a very basic enemy. So basically what you do is you fight her hair up, you start swinging, and Daughter is just going to heal whoever he hit. Really simple fight. Nothing can really go wrong here. He also has a tendency to miss, like, once per fight. And I feel like he always does it, like, right before the final turn. So sometimes you get lucky and everybody comes out at full HP.
the one detail uh, about the inventory management is this took me a while to like understand the significance of, but once I once I learned it, I realized just how significant it was. But the Staff of Benevolence in Daughter's Inventory is the seventh item in the slot. So it's at the top left of the second page of items. So anytime you need a heal, like you don't even think. You just go item up left. <laughs> or item left A, and then it's uh See? I'm i I'm so not used to thinking about it, I, I don't even know exactly what I do. It's <laughs> it's just muscle memory. You go into the items, you go left, you're right on top of it. It's a single input to, uh, to to get to it every single time. So there's a little bit of inventory management and manipulation later on uh, as items are being shuffled around to get the staff back in that position so that it's always there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alright, so these dragons uh, deal decent damage with their physical attacks, uh, but then they also have a flame attack, which... Basically, everybody in our party is very resistant to, so it does almost no damage. So, because of that, you're almost always going to come out of here with everybody at or near full HP. And it's worth a metal slime and a half. So. It's a really safe encounter. Good experience. Pierre up to level 16. It's unfortunate that it's not realistic to get Pierre up to level... I think it's 18. Uh, where he actually learns the Kiariku spell, which is uh, Numb Off, which removes paralysis from the entire party, which would come in really, really handy on the Gemma fight, but that's okay. We have Mangetsuso or uh, Full Moon Herbs to remove paralysis during that fight. So that chest was another uh, Elfin Elixir, so single use, full MP recovery. Again, we're going to hold on to that. For the end game. And I guess I'll go ahead and start discussing the Gemma fight. Um, he's got 4,500 HP, which, get used to that number, because most of the rest of the bosses in the game have 4,500 HP. Uh, he uh, has a Blaze Most spell, so he can deal up to 128 damage with that. Uh, he's got a physical attack, he can cast Bounce, uh, and then he. His most problematic ability is a Paralysis Breath, which can hit the whole party. I've had a few times where it actually landed on all three party members in one use, which counts as a party wipe. So if that happens, you just, boom, you're teleported out of the dungeon, it's over. It's very unfortunate. So our daughter has the Staff of Storos, which is what she used to remove the petrification uh, at the beginning of Gen 3. And that will also remove Paralysis in this fight, so she can remove paralysis at will as many times as we need. However, there's a chance that she might be the one that gets paralyzed. And in that case, we have the full moon herbs on uh, Sancho and Pierre, so that each of them have the ability to remove paralysis from her. And then you just hope that you don't need to <laughs> need it more than twice. It's not very common. Um, it's not a high success chance for it to land, so that's not usually an issue. Um... So yeah, from there, you're going to see the normal... Oh, actually, Daughter's Paralyzed right there, so we're going to get the Full Moon Herb. Um, I know. So you're, again, you're going to get the, the Fighter Harris to buy, kill Sancho and Pierre, and then Daughter's going to be healing every single turn. Uh, the only time she's not going to heal is if Gemma uses Bounce, like he just did, uh, in which case she's actually, assuming all of everybody's HP lines are at a safe spot, she's going to use the Zenithian Sword to remove Bounce. Now, it doesn't actually matter from, like, uh, like a spellcasting standpoint. We're not worried about him reflecting spells or anything. Uh, it's just that it, if he doesn't have Bounce active, then there's a chance yeah, that he might recast it and effectively do nothing for a turn. So, we, we want to remove it whenever we can safely do so, so that he might effectively pass a turn later on. And the main goal here is to keep Sancho and Pierre both above 128, so that they're not um, they're not in lethal range of Blaze Most. Uh, Daughter cannot be hit by it because she has the Zenithian Shield active, so she actually has the bounce effect. And uh, at the very beginning of the fight, Sancho used Increase, and then Daughter used the Fairy Sword, so her defense is super high. 
also, if Gemma decides to physical her, you know, she's not going to get one-shotted by that. And it's really just, you know, keeping everybody at safe HP levels and then hoping to get lucky with, uh, with the paralysis breath. There, you get the Z sword. One hundred and twenty two damage on that blaze, most almost max damage. You can roll up to one hundred and twenty eight damage. So, there will be times that both Sancho and Pierre will be close to. Or, like, if they're both under 128, that you'll either want to have one of them defending or have both son have both Pierre and Daughter healing. You know, kind of improvising ways to keep everybody safe, basically. But for the most part, it's pretty safe to just have Daughter doing the healing and you just keep going all in with Sancho and Pierre. Mm -hmm. Got a nice Kaishin there for about 300 damage. Okay. There we go. Get my down. No problems. Didn't troll us with the paralysis, bro. Right, and with that, our father is fully avenged. <laughs> and there, in the trolliest moment of the speedrun, Gemma's experience gets Pierre to level 18, and he learns numb off. <laughs> right after the fight where it would have come most in handy. Oh yeah, revenge is always great. Alright, so, two bosses down in here. Uh, come in here and grab the second dragon's eye. We picked up another one right after Gons. So, we're gonna head on out. And then while we're outside, you use Montan here to auto-heal. Uh, the way that the game prioritizes healing with Montan is it's gonna use the most efficient heal for the situation from the furthest back character in the party order. So, since the most efficient, or the most powerful heal that we have right now is heal more, and that is both on Hero and Pierre, then waiting until we're outside to cast Montan will prioritize using Hero's heal more instead of Pierre's, which keeps Pierre's MP for this trip into the, into the tower. So, that was very much a... Uh, a deliberate choice to cast outside before healing the party up because of that. Uh, but now we're taking another trip up into here. Uh, it's kind of an interesting tower they have to revisit over and over and over. <laughs> so now we gotta go up, drop down onto the top of the dragon statue, deposit the eyes, drop off, go back up the tower, and then go into the dragon's mouth, uh, which is where we're gonna get the dragon orb and the dragon staff. Like, that opening uh, on the walkway that we just walked past there is where the entrance to the dragon statue is going to be. But first we need to open it with the dragon, with the dragon eyes. Oh my goodness, it's a lot of encounters. Oi. <laughs> the grappling hook here. Now, what's interesting is after you place the second dragon's eye, you actually have to stay on the tile that you're on for you know a certain number of frames before it'll actually trigger the animation of opening the mouth of the dragon statue. So if you place the eye and then immediately walk off, you can actually drop down without opening this, the mouth and you have to come all the way back up again. I've done that a couple of times and it's terrible. There have been a, many other times where I've been like a half tile from dropping off and I realize that the animation never happened. 
in that moment, you know, your heart just leaps out of your chest, your adrenaline starts pumping. <laughs> I'm just like, oh my gosh, I almost screwed this up. I'm gonna spend as little time in here as possible. Yeah, so here you actually have to pause after putting it in. One more trip up to the tower, and then we can be done with this place. And then, move on to a dungeon that's even more dangerous than this one. It's back-to-back. -back, uh, Dragon Tower and then Great Temple. Just... So bad. <laughs> I mean, this one's super dangerous early on because your daughter is very low level. Uh, right now it's less problematic because she's gained some experience and is decently tanky. But the Great Temple is just so, so difficult. Like, every enemy in there can wipe out your party. And one of the issues with it that makes it so hard is we're actually forced to have Hero in the party. So, he's not very strong. He doesn't have very much defense. He doesn't have a lot of attack power. Although, the Dragon Staff that he's about to get right here has some decent damage on it. He's still not contributing very much. Um, so, you're, you're kind of forcefully gimped by the game. Uh, for the duration of the Great Temple. So, it, it, it makes it that much more dangerous getting through. Usually what we're going to do is focus on using Hero's MP to heal during that walk, so that we get value out of it before he dies. And from there on, it's just kind of hoping that Pierre's MP holds out. Turn to Zenithia here real quick. We're gonna drop off the dragon orb with Poussin. <laughs> oh yeah, I usually try to remember to warn people anytime I'm about to go on drag on uh, damage tiles. Uh, some wild flashing lights in this game. Yeah, so we give Poussin the dragon orb here. And it turns out that Dr. Agon is a dragon. Who knew? Who could have seen that one coming? So he give, gives us the, the Heavenly Bell, which we can use kind of as an improved magic carpet. We just bring that outside and he'll come pick us up and fly us wherever we want to go. Which functions like a combination of the... Uh, the magic carpet and flying the castle around. It's got the same speed as the magic carpet, but it can go over mountains like the like the castle can. And it's also the only way that we can get into the Great Temple. So here we return to Ned's Inn, which uh, I mentioned previously is a really convenient one-stop shop for healing and saving, because you got the inn and the church right next to each other. Nope, not gonna go for the inn. Or not not going for the save. I like it. It's aggressive. Anybody that knows me knows I like aggression. Yep, and here we fly into the Great Temple, which, uh, as you'll recall, at the beginning of Gen 2, this is where we were enslaved for ten years. Uh, we were helping to build this. Um, if you go into that door on the right side of the screen there, that's actually where you can get the Zenithian armor. But, uh... The legendary hero is kind of holding down the wagon for us, so we don't really need that. So here we get the Dragon Warrior fight. Two enemies just called Dragon Warrior. And we're going to use the uh, Staff of Zeus, we're going to cast Snowstorm, and the hero's going to use the Dragon Staff to cast the Dragon spell, or... What's that called now? Puff? It's, uh, it's the ability that turns the character into a dragon, and they just breathe fire uncontrollably. With the stay and pray in. Nice. I like that. The dragon? Okay. Wasn't there also a puff that did the same thing? Or was that just on, like, in certain side games? Not puff puff. That's different. <laughs> Alright, so here, this is Ramada, who is claiming to be our mother, but we answer the 
questions. No, no, yes, yes. I don't remember what the questions are, it's just the order of the answers. But if you answer them wrong, they actually curse the whole party before the fight, which is really annoying. Uh, so Ramada only has 2,000 HP. It's a nice break from the 4,500s that every other boss in the rest of the game has. Uh, and has a few different abilities, uh, most notably Snowstorm right there, which is a lot of AoE damage, and then also a very powerful single target physical attack. Uh, so the first part of this fight is spent getting your defenses set up to the point that you have the Fairy Sword and Zenithian Shield active on your daughter, so that she's not going to get hit by spells and she's also not going to get crushed by the physical attack. Uh, Aside from that, you want to get the fighter hairs up on Sancho and Hero. And then from there, it's just, you know, scrambling to keep everybody alive while you deal damage. Uh, it's not as long of a fight as others since she only has 2,000 HP, but uh, if it goes really heavy on the, the AoE effects, it can, uh, it, it, it can stack up damage pretty quickly. So sometimes you'll see a character defending if they can't... Like, if both characters need to be healed, you know, you'll see a, a defense on one and a heal on the other. Which you might see here. Yeah. But right, this is almost over. It's Atlas. All right, and right here is where our daughter is going to hit level 16, which means she now has the buy kill spell. We no longer need fighter hairs. So, our daughter's transformation into the true legendary hero is now complete. Who needs a son? But this is where we get to probably the deadliest part of the game. Like, this dungeon is so brutally difficult. Like, all of the random encounters in here deal so much damage. Like, if you're failing to run, people are going to die. Um, the, the boss at the end is going to be handled by Sancho, Pierre, and Daughter. So, the idea is to try to save as much of Pierre's MP as possible, just in case he needs to help out with healing on the final boss, which occasionally happens. Um, so you want to try to have Hero healing as much as possible during this walk before he dies. And then the main key is to get either Sancho or Daughter all the way to the end. Uh, you've still got a couple World Tree leaves to use here, so... My, my rule of thumb is most of my MP recovery can be blown in the Dragon Tower, so that I don't have to leave uh, to go restore any time in there. And then all of my World Tree leaves can be used in the Great Temple here. There's not really a point where like it matters too much to have a World Tree leaf after this, so... If one or the other, either Sancho or Daughter, makes it to the end, you can just revive the other one and then move on uh, to the boss fight. So these evil spirits are deceptively dangerous. For the longest time, I thought they did nothing because... Um, one of their most common actions is yeah. freezing waves, which removes Wait. all buffs from you and from all enemies. Yeah, I mean, that's but right. they also use war drums, which is a buy kill effect on all enemies. So they'll all double their attack power. And then usually, they'll all have that buff wiped away before the end of the round. And then there was one day where I was just like, oh, these enemies don't do anything. And they buy killed and then they all attacked. And they just one round wiped my party. <laughs> uh, you will actually see bazuzus in the demon world in this game. Multiples. So. I hope you enjoy bazuzus. They like Snowstorm. And these are the same dragons from uh, the Dragon Tower, so... Not, not particularly threatening. Oh, so that's interesting. That, did Hero already use all of his MP? I don't normally use Montan until we get to the end, but uh, Moko might also just be 
willing to use uh, an Elf and Elixir here on Pierre. Because there's a lot of MP recovery that we don't really need. It's mostly held on to in case things go really, really wrong. So that fight there, uh, Springers, the yellow Dragon Warrior reskins. That is the encounter that has given me the most trouble over my time running this game. It's really difficult to know how to deal with them because they deal a lot of physical damage and they cast uh, Kasap. So typically with single target attacking enemies, the strategy is cast increase, use the fairy sword, run away. But there's also a chance you do that and they just you know, you, you increase your defense, and then they just drop your defense by even more, and then start killing you anyway. But at the same time, if you try to run and fail, then you might get a decrease cast on you without, you know, first buffing yourself, and, and then you end up taking even more damage. So it's like, it can be a very stressful encounter to figure out how to deal with. Uh, Mogo's actually just going to fight him. <laughs> I like it. That's actually something I'd never consider. <laughs> it's such a terrifying encounter that I'm always just like, get away from it as quickly as possible, but... I do like that approach, I might have to try that out. So, one thing to note there though is that that does mean that Daughter casts Snowstorm, so her MP is going to be a little bit lower. Um, you basically have exactly enough MP to cast as many buy kills as you need to get through uh, the boss fight here. So I think we're pretty much just committed to using the prayer ring before starting that fight here. It's definitely safer than <laughs> failing to run from these guys a couple of times. Yep, there's the prayer ring. And it broke. Alright, so that's uh, <laughs> that's the end of the prayer ring, unfortunately. Uh, we do still have a couple elfin elixirs, and there's still one more that can be picked up uh, in the final town. So it's not that big of a deal. I generally expect that my prayer rings are going to be gone by the time Gemma's dead, so anything here is just a bonus. And here we have Evil. Evil Ivil. He's, uh... <laughs> The leader of the Order of Light. And fortunately this fight gives us access to the wagon, so we don't have to actually use Hero in this fight. In fact, we want to kill Hero off uh, during this encounter because we Hero's done for this game. <laughs> we don't we don't need him anymore. We don't want him to gain any more levels. It's a, it's a waste of time to watch him level up. So we usually kill him off on turn one here. So Evil is on a set turn order. Uh, he's first going to use a cold breath attack right there. Then he's going to uh, put up... Okay, that flash there is going to put up bounce. Then he's going to attack. And that attack is always going to hit for 95 damage. And then he's going to defend on the turn after. And so since we're not going to deal much damage here, Sancha's going to use the Zenithian shield. Pierre's going to use the Zenithian sword to remove bounce. And then Daughter's going to catch up to healing there. Uh, and then he uses Explode At right there, which uh, that's why we use the Z-Shield on Sancho to reflect some of that damage back. And then Ival's going to flash again, and this one is actually a Freezing Wave, so our buy kill and Reflect are now gone. And it just repeats that cycle over and over again. Blizzard, Flash, Attack, Defend, Explode At, Purge. So you always know what this boss is going to do. You can very much get this fight entirely down to muscle memory if you practice it. And it's a really fun fight to execute because you, you get to just burn through it super fast. The only real variance comes in if, um, if after the cold breath, if we've got two characters that are under 95, then... You might want to have Pierre helping out with uh, a heal, or swap a character out so that they're they're not going to hit get hit. So like right here, the only threat is going to be, you know, taking that 95 damage right after the blizzard. 
But as long as you don't lose track of where you are in the rotation here, then uh, nobody's really at risk. So since you know when uh, when specific attacks are coming out, you'll notice that characters aren't necessarily being healed right away. So like right after the Cold Breath, for example, uh, Daughter's going to cast Vi Kill on Pierre instead of healing up, and that's totally fine. But like right here, everybody's under 95. That's <laughs> that's a little bit dangerous. So we're going to use the World Dew heal everybody up. It's really the best spot to use World Dew. It, it can come in handy if you want to rush the setup on the final boss, but this is where it usually comes most in here. So you'll notice that Moko is swapping in a corpse occasionally. Uh, that goes back to the agility turn order thing that I was uh, mentioning previously. On that turn, uh, Evil is using freezing waves, and he might outspeed our team in do freezing waves before we get an attack off. So what that does is it makes sure that Sancho is going to go before evil, so we're going to get that by kill attack, no matter what. So you're, you're not taking chances that you're just going to get less damage on that turn. Plus, Pierre's going to need to be out the next turn anyway for the, uh, for the cold breath. And just like that, evil's gone. Really easy fight. Easy fight, but a fun fight. And this experience is going to get, uh, it's going to get Slalin up to level 20, where he's going to learn the Metapani spell, uh, which is Confuse, or Chaos, I'm not sure what the modern name for that is. Uh, but we're going to use that on phase one of the final boss, because uh, he summons adds, and we use Confuse to turn his adds on himself. It's the main reason why Slalin is so important. And here there's going to be a little bit of inventory management because there's a brief period where Sancho and the kids are going to be taken out of our party. So similar to when other characters uh, leave the party, anything that they have in their inventory that's not equipped is going to be sent to the bank. Um, accessories will also be sent to the bank. So if you leave the meteorite armband on Daughter, for example, that'll end up in the bank as well. So uh, we're going to move the staff, we're going to move the meteorite armband... Uh, we're going to make sure that we've got a couple fighter hairs moved off. We're going to make sure that we've got all of the rings. And we just calmly walk out of here. There are no random encounters during this fall. Just get to enjoy the wonderful music. Yep, it's finally time to reunite with Flora. But first we get to have a talk with Mom. Uh, she actually talks to us through the, the life ring that we just picked up after that fight. And she's going to tell us not to come to the demon world to save her. She wants us to just go live our life happily with our family while she holds the demon king in check. If you might have noticed throughout this run, we're not good at following instructions from our parents. So, when she says don't go to the demon world, the first thing we're going to do is go to the demon world. <laughs> okay, second thing we're going to do. First, we're going to go get the final keys so that we have access to the, to the demon world. Yeah, we definitely did not get over a rebellious child phase. So here we get the wonderful reunion scene with 
Flora and the kids. Then we're going to swing by the friend bank, pull the family out. Uh, again, there's a little bit of runner preference here. I only take Sancho and daughter. Uh, you can bring Flora and your son as well for extra healing, but you got to remember to kill them off uh, prior to the end of the Hell Battlers. Otherwise, you're going to sit through a whole bunch of levels that you don't want to deal with. So we'll see what Mocha does here. It's Sancho. And our daughter. Okay, so we are pulling everybody out for this one. Makes sense. Marathon safety, might as well. Yeah, we got seven casts of heal more on Flora. We got some healing on Hero. Or <laughs> Hero. On our son as well. So we're going to re return to Salabona here and complete a side quest that we kind of just ignored up to this point. So remember that jar that we had to go check the color of right after the wedding? We go talk to Ludman here and he's freaking out because, you know, he's hearing rumors that the jar may no longer be blue. So he's going to have us go check on it again. And this time around it's going to be red which means that a great evil is returning. Yes, glory and adventure. <laughs> the one thing to note is, in Gen 3 you cannot actually cast Return while you're in Ludman's house anymore. And the entire reason for that is because that maid comes and talks to us. They don't need to skip that. And so instead of just having it, like, flagged for not being able to do it until after that conversation, it's just flat disabled in Gen 3. So you actually have to walk out of the house there. So, we're gonna go up here. Check the pot. It's red. Dun, dun, dun. And now it's time to juice the moose. So, this jar has been sealing away... A, a giant moose, basically. And Lidman's family, for generations, has been watching over it. I don't know what they were expecting to do if it ever returned, because, I mean, it's not exactly a family of warriors. <laughs> but, whatever. Luckily for him, we're here. So, this can actually be done at any point in Gen 3. The reason that we do it now is that after uh, fighting evil, Pierre has the Heal All spell, which obviously heals all. Uh, it restores the target to maximum HP. And what we're going to do is give some, give Pierre the Meteorite Armband, so he's always going to outspeed Bjorn. So anytime we need to heal, Pierre's just going to top off whoever needs it. And your basic safety lines here are, it's about you know, 90 to 100 HP. You, know, you don't want to go under that, because then you end up uh, potentially in trouble. So, Hero is forced into this uh, fight again. So we use him to cast Upper on Sancho. We have Pierre use the Fighter Sword. Or vice versa, I'm not sure. Basically one of the two is going to use the, the Fairy Sword, the other one's going to get Upper from Hero. And then we let Hero die, because it doesn't matter. And from here, it's just... Keep swinging. Um, Bjorn does cast Upper. I'm not sure if... Uh, Mocha put the, the Zenithian Sword on Pierre or not, but... Assuming Pierre has the Zenithian Sword... You can use that to remove Upper and keep pushing more damage. Yep, there it is. Like, not having the sword adds, like, maybe 30 seconds to the fight. It's not a huge deal. Because, on the one hand, you're not attacking that turn, but on the other hand, all of your attacks are dealing more damage. And, once again, this is a boss with 4,500 HP. Overall, it's a it's a very very safe fight. Wow, double crit, nice. <laughs> back to back patient.
But the only way to lose this fight is if you just space out and don't heal. But you're, you're never gonna need to heal so much that you run out of MP or anything. It's just not that long of a fight. And defeating Bjorn gives us the final key, which we can use to open the gate that's keeping us from getting to the Dark World. So we're going to walk out of here, cast return back to Elhaven, hop on the boat, and go back into the, uh, the seaside shrine that we went through quite some time ago. So right there, using the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the flying carpet is just to eliminate random encounters. The enemies there can cast beat, so you, you don't want to deal with that if you don't have to. And as you saw there, Moko accidentally hopped off the boat. It is so easy to do that. Like there's, there's not like a, a leniency frame when you go up to the shore where it's just like you have to hold down off to the side in order to actually disembark. It's like as soon as you touch it, you hop off the boat. Sailing is impossible in this game. And so here we're going to use the the fire ring and the water ring that we got before the wedding, and then also the life ring that we got after fighting Ivol. And that's going to open the portal to the demon world. Moose <laughs> smoothies for everyone. I wonder what a moose smoothie tastes like. You know what? I don't wonder what a moose smoothie tastes like. I think I'm good without that information. Right, and here we get a, another conversation with our mom, and she's like, Oh, you didn't listen to me. Well, I guess since you're here, I might as well try to help you. Here, take this Sage's Stone. So the Sage's Stone, uh, like in other games, is an unlimited use item that uh, heals the entire party for about 60 HP. And that includes uh, characters that are in the wagon. So Sancho's going to hold on to that and... Basically, he's at the end of every single round since his agility is zero. I think I've had Moose Tracks ice cream before. It sounds familiar. So a little bit more inventory management here. Uh, we want the meteorite armband on Slalin so that uh, he can expel certain encounters. And here's the bazoozas that I promised. And every encounter in the demon world here is extremely dangerous. Like, we can't fight any of these if we wanted to, so it's just run forever. <laughs> Our meat shield son has already uh, been clobbered and thrown back into the wagon. That's an encounter. Blizzard Hawk. Nice. Got away. And that brings us to the town of Jahana. This is the final town in the game. Um, we are going to hit the weapon shop up here in the corner and sell a few things to get up to 21,000 gold so that we can buy the Blizzard Sword for Pierre. And that's going to be the weapon that he ends the game with. And then we're probably going to head to the inn to pick up the Elfin Elixir since the prayer ring broke. And so this point, it's just a mad dash for Evil Mountain. Um, 
everybody is expendable during this walk because we have the ability to return to Evil Mountain once we've reached it. It, it unlocks as a return point. So we can go straight back to the dungeon. We just need one person to get through here. It's obviously most ideal to keep everybody alive for it, but if we have to revive people afterwards, we can. We still got a few things that we can sell to, to get enough gold to do so. And this is where we'll start looking into potentially using Brownie's uh, Armband of Sacrifice. There are some encounters here that have like six enemies, seven enemies, that are super dangerous. And when you see those, you'll probably uh, see Brownie going out to force end that encounter. Yeah, the, the Grand Dragons here are actually recruitable. But our hero is not nearly high enough level to recruit them. Ooh, that was a big hit. Yeah, so the Gigantes is susceptible to expel, um, but they also have a very, very powerful attack. That <laughs> nearly one-shotted Sancho. We're almost there. There, the, uh, the the forced turn order was used again to make sure that Sancho could heal everybody with the Sage of Stone prior to expelling all of those. And here we are. This is Evil Mountain. This is the end game. So these floor tiles only deal one damage per step, so it's not that big of a deal. But uh, most of what you're going to see here is uh, some combination of Sancho and Pierre running from everything. Uh, there's a couple things that, you know, you're going to see Slalom pop out for expels, but most of this is just going to be running away. Everybody's favorite evil spirits. Oh, there's the Kassap. See, since Sancho got his defense lowered there, uh, Mogo swapped out for Pierre to run away since Pierre's defense wasn't decreased. So here you probably see a swap back to Sancho <laughs> and then run away again. So, learning how to deal with the encounters in here is like one of the really interesting parts of this run because each enemy formation has so many ways that it can screw you over. And figuring out the safest way to handle each formation is really interesting. Like, my general rule of thumb is if it's a group of enemies that do single target attacks, I'll usually do Sancho and Pierre to spread out the damage. Uh, but then, like, if you get that encounter with three Bazoozas, they like to cast Snowstorm, and so I'll do uh, a single character out to run to limit the damage. But these Springers are just... Ugh. They're brutal. Now, I don't think Sancho, our daughter, died in Great Temple, so I believe we still have two world leaves left, which opens up a lot of options for keeping people alive and really lets you just keep pushing forward. These flare dragons. Uh, the flare dragons have a, a severe poison that they can inflict that, in addition to causing damage as you walk around, uh, also deals about 40 damage per turn in combat. And I believe you can expel... Either expel or Aeola Shield works effectively on them. I don't remember which. I think it's expel. I usually just run from them. Nice. So, here we have a brief little fight here. A very brief fight. Slalom is just going to come in here and uh, make his presence known. 
Easy peasy. 100% expo. <laughs> so, we have finally found our mom. We've been searching for her for 4 hours and 50 minutes, and we finally found her. So, now, we can all go off and be happy together, right? Oh, wait, no, that's not... This is not that kind of game. There is no happiness. Mom's going to die. And she has green hair. And with that, the ghost of Papas shows up. He says, Our children's destiny is in their own hands. Let's go be together in the afterlife. Now that we're both dead, huzzah. We are almost through with this. Uh, we're going to dip in here real quick for a couple items. Uh, the first is going to be the Echoing Hat, which is in this chest up ahead. Uh, this is a hat that we're going to give to Slalin and causes his spells to double cast. So if he casts uh, Kasap, it's going to cast it twice. If he casts Increase, it's going to increase twice. Very, very powerful. It's going to allow us to get our boss setups very quickly. And then we're also going to pick up this water pitcher, which we need to douse some lava. Yeah, this hero is not allowed to be happy, ever. I'm surprised at the end of the credits he doesn't just die. <laughs> You know, that's a good question. Why didn't Papa's talk, like, just go full Obi-Wan and teach us how to double attack? Hero would actually be useful if he could double attack. Maybe. Uh, he still can't take a hit, never mind. Right, so we use the water pitcher here. Alright, we're gonna sneak over to the right here. This is the, the Metal King helmet, which is gonna go to Pierre. And it's gonna be like a 40 defense increase over uh, his current iron mask. Yeah, 35. 45. 35? 45, yeah. So, Pierre is fully tanked up. We've got almost all of our equipment. We're still gonna pick up an Orhalcum Fang for Slalin, but we're basically done changing out equipment for the run here. Uh, in this room, we can't actually find Metal Kings, which we do not want to fight because they have the chance spell, which can cause many, many problems for us. Not the least of which is wiping out the entire party's MP. Oh. <laughs> that was a little bit close. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, this is where I'd probably throw Brownie out. <laughs> yep. Okay. So here you're going to get to see the, uh, the farewell armband ending that fight. <laughs> Tried to hold on to that for one more encounter just in case, but sometimes you, you just gotta throw Brownie out there. Br Brownie is basically a holy hand grenade at this point. <laughs> Alright, good walk there. So, now this room has no encounters. There's only one room left in the game that has random encounters, and we'll probably only see one. There's a chance that we might not have any more random encounters at all. But the, uh, the next room is a little bit weird. Because somebody decided that my Dragon Quest name needed a tile puzzle. Oh, this is interesting. This isn't the way that I do this puzzle. I usually loop around to the right. I wonder if this one's faster. Looks like it's basically just a reverse of what I normally do. Okay, yeah. 
It's, it's basically the, the exact number of steps just moving in the opposite direction. <laughs> kind of funny. This is actually me noticing that this puzzle is mirrored. All the times I've run this, I never noticed it. Alright, so this room right here has random encounters again. And this is probably the last one we're gonna see. Hello, big eyes. Slalin the Master. Alright, so we open this chest and it's gonna trigger a fight, so we're gonna give Pierre the, the fairy sword so that he can cast upper on himself. And very similar to how we did the uh, Lava Savages at the end of the volcano, uh, Pierre's gonna solo these guys. So Sancho's gonna use the Sage Stone, Pierre's gonna use the Fairy Sword, Daughter's gonna buy kill Pierre, and then we're gonna pull Sancho and Daughter out of the fight. And it's gonna take three hits each. Uh, they have, what, 450 HP? Yeah. Sancho comes in to use the Sage of Stone just to top people off for the upcoming fight. Now this is where I'll usually try to remember to bring in Flora and Sun if they haven't been killed off. Because otherwise they're gonna they're gonna gain levels there. So basically by the time that fight's over, you wanna make sure that the only living characters are Sancho, Pierre, Daughter, Hero, and Slalin. Otherwise that experience is gonna end up wasting time. So, we can do a little bit of inventory swaps here to make sure... Oh. Yeah, so Fairy Sword's gonna go back to Daughter. Uh, Z Sword is gonna go to, da to Daughter. Meteorite Armband needs to go to the Daughter. Make sure she has a staff. Uh, she's gonna need MP recovery, so she's getting the Elfin Elixirs. World Tree Leaf. It's going to Sancho, okay. I usually give the Leaf to Pierre. Just so that if I need to revive somebody, I don't skip out on using the Sage of Stone on that turn. And then we make sure that Stalin's got his Echoing Head equipped. The Orialcum Fang. Taking a few steps there to get some MP back with the Hat of Happiness. And then swap that over to Daughter. And we are going into the final boss now. So, this is Mirror Dross. He's got two phases. The first one uh, follows a pattern where uh, on turn one, he's either going to use his Freezing Breath or cast Marizoma, which is... Uh, blaze most and then on second turn he's going to either do a physical attack or freezing waves and then on the next turn he's either gonna uh, call for help and get two killer machines or two evil clouds uh, what we want to see is the evil clouds because we can confuse those with slalom and uh, have them help out pushing damage on the boss but we get the killer machines so this is fun so these are probably going to get expelled, but you can't do it right away because it's going into a turn where he can kill Slalom. Uh, I was a little bit freaking out there because the killer machines do a lot of damage if you don't have increase up. So that was a very, very dangerous situation. But we got Slalom expelling the, the killer machines. So when the next time it gets up to the summoning turn, we're going to hope for clowns, and we get killing machines again. Oh boy. So the the part where this fight becomes really problematic is if freezing waves wipes out your, your increases, and then the killing machines deal a lot of damage. Ah, so Pierre goes down there. Oh no. So we do have a world leaf on Sancho still, but it's not safe to, to do anything with that yet. Um, 
This is kind of a tough spot to be in. What we're probably going to see is... Might see increase heal Sancho and then... Oh my gosh, and then Slalom got killed oh before Expel. <laughs> okay, so you kind of have to go for the... Uh, we only have one leaf, so... Kind of in trouble here. This has not gone well. <laughs> what is this? This is Miradross being a jerk. Yeah, if we only have the one leaf, then this is probably a situation where you just... Force away. Okay, so we have a leaf on Sancho and on Daughter. So, Marco's going to have to figure out what turn we're on to figure out who can safely be revived. Because we need both Pierre and Slalin alive. So both of those leaves are going to get used here. And it's the Freezing Wave turn. So up next is going to be Freezing Breath or Marizona. So it's not safe for Slalin to be revived here because he'll probably just be immediately killed. So we're going to kind of tank this turn. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Alright, we, we are full on in improvising territory here. Uh, I'm hoping that Pierre might go before the killer machine. It's a little bit risky. She's looking at using heal all on daughter, but it's not it's not a safe turn. So we do need to find out a way to get Slalom back still. This is not a position I've ever been in, and seeing it right now, I'm very happy I've never been in this one. <laughs> Okay, so with this order, Sancho's gonna go first with the Sage of Stone. Daughter's gonna heal herself. There's Freezing Waves, so everybody's defense has been lowered again. So we're going Fairy Sword to increase Daughter's defense. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we're hoping to see a physical attack. Not a Freezing Wave. Oh no. <laughs> this is. Yeah, so you probably have to use the staff on daughter. Uh, I think right now I would go Sancho Corpse, daughter, get the first action, Sage of Stone, daughter, heal herself, and just kind of repeat that until you get into a safe spot. Oh, okay, that works. That worked. <laughs> That was risky, but it worked. <laughs> okay. So we're just looking for a spot where we can go Sancho, Slalin, Daughter. Revive Slalin. Actually, which, uh, which leaf did we use? Did we use the leaf on Sancho or the one on Daughter? I don't remember. Okay, so Sancho still has a leaf, so we're going to try to do it here. Okay, we got everybody back. <laughs> oh my god. All of these sounds are also going on in my head. <laughs> I very much know where Moko's coming from here. So, we gotta... Okay, we got rid of those. We're really, really hoping to see clowns on the next one. Not killer machines. So we're probably gonna go Pierre, Sancho, Daughter. Uh, depending on where he is in his cycle, he might be on a summoning turn. In which case, it would be okay to have Slalom out for increase right now. I didn't see what his previous action was. So it looks like, yeah, we're going for the increase. Okay. That's what we want to see. This is good. However, it's not safe to leave Slalin out on this turn, so we gotta pull him. Uh, because Freezing Breath will one-shot him, and if he gets targeted with Marizoma, that will one-shot him as well. Alright, so now 
Solon's going back out for Metapani to try to confuse these guys. Alright, got one. Alright, got them both confused. Okay. Woo! The fight becomes a lot safer at this point <laughs> because they're they're not going to attack us at all. The only thing dealing damage at this point is going to be Mirror Dross. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this has been a stressful encounter. So, worst case scenario, the uh, the clowns can run away while they're confused, which means we're going to get another summon phase and we might get more killer machines. Um, but as long as they stick around and they just keep attacking Mirror Dross for us, this is eventually going to push us into phase two. That was, uh, that was some really intense improvisation, but a great recovery by Moko there. That was very much a worst case scenario. <laughs> and we came out the other side alright. Yeah, we choose Flora for a few purposes. Um, we basically, we get more money, we get water flying clothes, and um, she's effectively immortal for a certain part that's very unstable. Alright, so that's phase one out. <laughs> that was the most intense phase one you're ever going to see. I hope everybody enjoyed that. <laughs> so phase two is going to have 4500 HP, and it'll randomly select from three different AI loops here at the beginning. And it's, it's not going to change the loop. So once we see the first action, we're going to know exactly what the uh, what pattern it's on. So we'll always know what ability is up next. Um, the the trick here being that the strong and medium patterns both have a chance to take two actions. Uh, the easy pattern only takes one action per turn, but has uh, very high agility. And so there's actually a chance that he outspeeds daughter, which makes some healing turns a little bit dangerous. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to throw Hero out by himself just to see what pattern we're on. That's an effort, of course. <laughs> After that phase one, <laughs> why be surprised that we get the strong pattern? All right. So this pattern is very brutal. Um, basically, the pattern is physical attack, flames, freezing waves, explode it, and then heal. And he can take two actions per turn. So uh, what we did at the very beginning here was Daughter used the Zenithian Sword to remove his bounce, and then Slalin double cast Rukadon, uh, the Kasap spell. So the goal is to have Pierre attack every single turn, because this boss is regenerating 500 HP every time he heals. And since he heals every fifth action and can take two actions per turn, he can heal quite a bit. It's really hard to know where you are in this fight at any given time, uh, just because of how often he can heal. So what we're seeing here is uh, Pierre staying out alone for the attack turn with potential flames, because Pierre will at full HP, Pierre will survive the attack plus flames together. Um, everybody else is going to take so much damage from flames that it's too risky to have them out. So you're really kind of balancing uh, attacking versus healing on this turn and constantly using the wagon to swap people out. Hey. Oh! <laughs> Alright, we got a little Slalom turn in there. Slalom is gone. Alright, so it's, now he's gonna heal and possibly attack. Oh man. Yeah, if he takes too many double actions, it can be really hard to keep up here. Uh, this pattern is the main reason that you want to keep the Elfin Elixirs on Daughter. Because she's gonna have to rebuff uh, by kill after every single freezing wave. And uh, if he keeps double acting, then over the course of the fight, you're gonna be casting by kill so many times that you, you might go through more than two full rounds of MP on Daughter. But as long as you're, uh, as long as you've got the MP recovery and you're smart with, uh, with HP lines and you don't lose track of where you are in the pattern, um, it, it's very, very doable. I'm, I find that I'm most comfortable with the medium pattern. Uh, the strong pattern is probably my second most comfortable. And ironically, I'm least comfortable with the easy pattern, but that's primarily because I don't trust the agility on that phase. And, uh... And I never see it, so I almost no practice with it. 
Uh, he can't heal twice for 500 because he always takes the same actions in the same order. So he'll go attack, flames, freezing waves, explode it, heal. Um, the amount of times that he heals comes down to how often he double acts because double acting is just going to accelerate that process and get him back to the heals every time. And you'll see with by kill up, he is hitting for about 300 damage and heal is 500. So if he keeps double acting, then you're making almost no progress per round, and it can take a very long time to get through this fight. Yeah, my my last run that I did actually chose easy pattern, and I was so confused because I have no practice on easy, because I never get it. I almost exclusively get strong pattern when I'm doing runs. So, daughter's gonna be using that elfin elixir pretty soon. Her MP is getting low. But it's not safe to use it yet. She needs to help out with the heals here. Sancho's HP is getting pretty low. Okay, so now we've got an attack and possibly flames. Yep, double action. So the good news is that at full HP, uh, Pierre can survive both the attack and the flames, and then he can also survive the explode at. So he can he can take an entire cycle of damage from full HP, uh, which is the only reason that this is really even doable. <laughs> because a lot of times on that explode at turn, that's when you have to be rebuffing uh, by kill on Pierre. Like any cycle that you don't uh, by kill Pierre, you're basically guaranteed to lose progress, especially if he double acts. So he's only got 4,500 HP, but over the course of this fight, we're probably going to do about 11,000 damage total. <laughs> Here it goes. That's GG. Mirror Dross goes down. Okay. That was that was an incredible comeback from the way that phase one went sideways. <laughs> that was one of the most impressive Mirror Dross kills I've ever seen. And that is basically all there is to Dragon Quest V. Uh, we're going to get our world tour sequence where we're going to be leaving various towns after revisiting people and get our credits, but uh, that is it. That was incredible. <laughs> I cannot believe we actually got through phase one after that. That's just that's how good of a runner Moko is. When you when you run up on a situation like that, being able to pull that back from the brink. That that's so difficult to do. And then following it up with keeping your cool on the strong pattern is pure professionalism right there. I don't know about you guys, but my adrenaline's pumping just from watching that fight. Henry. Now Henry's got his own son, who's a right little brat, just like his dad was.
it's such a long walk out of Reinhardt. Fortunately, they, they cut this one off at the bridge, so you don't actually have to finish walking out of town. A couple more stops to make. Stop by Santa Rosa here. We're gonna go see Bianca. We're gonna go see Ludman. We're gonna head back on home. Sit on the throne, and uh, that's when the credits are gonna begin. Oh, so one interesting thing that I didn't mention is uh, entering Ludman's house in Gen 3 will automatically revive your kids if they're in the party. So if you uh, if you ever need to revive daughter, like if she dies in, like, in the Dragon Tower, for example, uh, you can actually come back here with her and your party, walk into his house and then leave and she'll instantly be alive. It also uh, does that if your son is in your party too, though, so <laughs> if, you, if you bring him along, you have to remember to kill him off afterwards. The legendary hero is indeed Pierre. Pierre is the most powerful being in existence. And this run would be so different without him. <laughs> uh, like a, a, a PR-less percent is not something I, I think I would want to do. It would definitely be a much longer run. That would probably actually require you to level up heroes significantly higher uh, to recruit some later game enemies. Not sure what you would take along. Pierre's very, very special among monsters because of uh, all the stuff that he can equip. He's basically a human character for all intents and purposes. Right, we are finally back to Granvania. We go sit on our throne, we dance with our wife, and finally. For the first time in almost five and a half hours, we get to experience happiness without it being ruined. <laughs> we did it. Who's dying in the Eucharist? Oh. Now, can you imagine if they just like killed Sancho off in the ending credits? I think that would probably be the uh, the most heartbreaking death in the run. The world is saved. Mom is dead. But we're happy. Bye. 
わかんなくなってきた Alright, so we are going to be moving straight into Dragon Quest VI once this wraps up, so don't go anywhere. We're not done yet. We're only about two-thirds of the way through this relay. Probably less. <laughs> but thanks a lot, everybody, for hanging out for Dragon Quest V. It's uh, probably my favorite game in the series. Always love seeing it. So I really appreciate the opportunity to join along and discuss it while watching an amazing player like Moko. Had a ton of fun today. I still can't believe how amazing that Mirror Dress fight was. <laughs> like, I have chills from how awesome that was. But... But from this Dragon Quest lover to all of you guys out there, thank you very much for being here. Enjoy Dragon Quest VI, and I will be seeing you guys out there. ありがとうございました。リスさんよろしくお願いします。